This week, we're talking about a little unknown abandoned town who had a bit of a monster problem. Fort Lock, Alaska, and the Nantanook, or Nantanok, or you be the judge. Listener discretion is always advised. All aboard the Midnight Train. Hello, passengers, and welcome to the Midnight Train Podcast, where we bring the dark to light. Hey, before we start, do me a big favor. Head on over to wherever you're listening to this podcast right now and find Icons and Outlaws and subscribe, because guess what? The first episode's dropping on May 1st. I heard heard that the first episode... Uh Uh-huh going to be a banger. <laughs> They're all bangers. Yeah. And of course, that is the new music podcast that Logan and Jeff and, and myself have done together. And it's yeah. it's awesome. And we're putting out new music for each one that we've actually covered a song from each one. So just do us a favor and do that. I know I didn't want to do that right in the beginning, but you know what? It felt right. Hey, whatever, man. Right. It's the first episode, by the way, if you're wondering why it's such a banger, is actually about the history of Mushmouth Records. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Everyone's going over there right now. Like, really? <laughs> you guys should do one. That'd yeah. be funny as fuck. Yeah. No, he's, he's, he's lying to you. He's lying. Am I, though? Uh, he's, he's lying. Yes. Am I? Anyway, maybe. Maybe not. Anyway, get over there. Icons and Outlaws. Make sure you subscribe. Tell your friends, please. It's definitely a little bit different than what we're doing here. Which Shameless self-promotion. It's not as uh, vulgar, for sure. Well, that's good. Yeah, because over here, we make fun of and joke about creepy shit while bringing you as much information on each topic as possible. And we do swear some. Fuck. What? Whoa. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we do. We do. And if you don't like that, listen, we get it. It's no problem. And, and listen, things can get pretty dark here, too. You know, so, you know, sometimes we talk we, a, we talk about murder. Yep. We talk about... Uh, dismemberment. Dismemberment. Dis- uh, disembowelment. Yes. Um, yes. Things of that nature. Decapitations. Correct. Yes. You know. Um, all all the good things in life. Sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's what we talk about. So listen, oh, this this guy talking right now, that's Mr. Moody. Say hi, Mr. Moody. You talking me? Yeah. Wow. Hey, you know what? It's great to be here. Yeah, that's right. And I, of course, am the conductor of the cryptic Jonathan Sayer. And uh, yeah, welcome to the Midnight Train. And uh, listen, I was thinking this yeah. week for the... <laughs> you, uh, uh-oh. I know, right? <laughs> Instantly. <laughs> you okay? Yeah. You didn't yeah. hurt yourself, did you? A couple times. Oh, wow. This week, I think for a Patreon bonus, yeah, I got a good one. I want to talk about a lady, but not just any lady. I want to hey talk lady! about. <laughs> I want to talk about Ireland's female executioner. Yeah, <laughs> you ever heard this? about her? No. So I'm going to Ireland here soon. So I'm really pumped up about it. Yeah, and you got to get your accent on point. Yeah. Well, I, I, they really don't like it when you do that over there. <laughs> I, I Even though I do, have, I've got to say that I've got a pretty good one. That's more Scottish. That is more Scottish. So I've got to, I got to find it. I got to find it. I, I've been trying not to do it. So when I go over there, I don't take, get beat take up. Take your Boston accent and evolve it into an Irish accent. So just go over there the entire time and talk like this. <laughs> go over there. Top of the morning, you fucking bastards. I said you got to evolve it into <laughs> oh, the Irish oh, accent. Oh, oh, oh. Just <laughs> start there, though. Jesus Christ. Where's that fucking leprechaun? <laughs> <laughs> I really, really want the leprechaun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is going to be a hell of a show. Anyway, I have not heard of her, no. I'm okay, sorry. so her name <laughs> is Elizabeth Segru or Sugru. And uh, basically, she like, got her like job. Like a car, Subaru? Not Subaru, Sugru. Like or Subaru. Forest, like the Subaru Forester? And they call her Lady Betty as well. Lady Betty. Lady Betty. And uh, from what I hear, she was actually up on the chopping block, or her husband was, and uh, she kind of just said, I'm going to do this, and then became a uh, I got the shit, yo. A- a executioner. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. I want to talk about her. It's going to be pretty cool. So okay. get over to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash accidental dads if you want that, or go to the midnight train podcast.com and you can find it there. Support the show, get bonuses. You know how it is. Yep. Right? Yeah. Right. I mean, why wouldn't you want to do that? I mean, you should want to do that. So you've never heard of her, uh, actually? I have not. No, that's news really? to me. Really? That is news to me, my friend. Really? I, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm baffled. 
by this. Look, I know a lot of things. You do? I, I didn't know that, though. Do you know a lot of things? I do, actually. You'd be surprised. What What kind of things do you know? Lots of stuff. <laughs> I'm very, um, uh, anything I'm very in, knowledgeable in anything in particular? stupid shit. Anything in particular? Nah, nothing particular. That's what I'm saying. I just know a lot of dumb stuff. A lot of a lot of dumb stuff. I'm a smart stuff. guy. People don't realize it. I like to play stupid. That way, people don't expect shit from me. That's the way to do it. Yeah, that's the way to do it. All that's right. What I did. That's my whole high school career summed up in one sentence. Right there. <laughs> and then amazing. every once in a while, I'd be like, mm-hmm. I'd do yeah. something. Everybody be like, what, what the f- <laughs> Wait, are you cheating? What the hell? Right. Yeah, dude. It was great. That's awesome. It was fun to watch all the smart kids be like, "What the? F- what? This- that's good. Keep them on the toes. Yeah. All right. That's good it. Good times. All right, so let's save the rest of the business stuff until the end. Yeah. And let's just get into this because it's going to be a great episode. It's actually it. yeah. something I had no idea about that you brought to my attention. I didn't until I actually got to thank my wife for this. Yeah, Danny? Because she sent me something about it. She's like, have you ever heard of this? And I was like, she's like, have you ever heard of this town? I'm like, no. And she sent me a link to something and I was like, <gasps> how have I not heard of this? Yeah, I'm actually surprised that I haven't either. I know. It's great. So I tell you what, let's get, let's get into this. Let's turn down the lights. Yeah. Adjust our seats. Look, I think you just want to do this to get close to me. I, well, yeah. Like you do this every yeah, week, and yeah. then I end up like leaving feeling dirty. All right. Well, keep your clothes on. Maybe that won't happen. <laughs> and let's get creepy. <laughs> but first, here's a toast, all you beautiful motherfuckers. Oh. Mm. What are you drinking? Water. Water. <laughs> you got a peach tea. I'm actually drinking liquid death. Oh. <clears throat> what flavor? Uh, this is the mango. Oh, that was good. Mango chainsaw. Yeah, that was good. Chainsaw. What the fuck? Did that fit right in that song right there. <laughs> what the? What the? What the? What the? Fuck? <laughs> <laughs> DJ Johnny Vegas here every day. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's it's uh, it's been a uh, it's did been a day. Did you just pull out the Johnny Vegas card? Yeah, I did. Oh man, I should never do that again. <laughs> My wife might divorce me if I ever do that again. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't get into that story, but guess what? I'm not gonna just tell her that the episode involved boobs. She won't listen. Oh boy, there it is, and it's over, <laughs> and it's over. It's probably not pounding on the ceiling right <laughs> yeah, now. I heard that. <laughs> so today we're talking about a ghost town. Okay. In uh, a little place called Alaska. Uh, what is, where, what? That is uh, the 50th state of the United States of America. Technically, it's not. It's 49th? No, I believe, uh, actually, if I'm not mistaken. What? Well, no, keep reading. Are, and you, I'll, are, you, are you correcting me now? Because Puerto Rico is technically not a state. No, I know that, but okay. I'm not talking about that. You keep going. Oh, okay. And it's here in the U.S., and it's huge, and we bought it from Russia, and yada, yada. And it's rumored to have been abandoned because of, uh, well, you know, wait for it. A killer Bigfoot. Yes. Yeah, buddy. A killer Bigfoot. Uh, not going to lie, didn't know a whole lot about this. In fact, I'm going to, uh, I'm lying now because I didn't know anything about this. So, yeah. No, you did not. I did not. Neither did I. So we're going to look at a place called Portlock, Alaska. And after that, uh, we're going to look at a couple other haunted or creepy ghost towns as well. So the history of Portlock, all right, it's a ghost town in the U.S. state of Alaska, located on the southern edge of the Kenai Peninsula. Oh, yeah. Sorry, the whole Alaska thing. I I would forgot. Uh, the reason I said that is because I wasn't you're sure. wrong. Well, Ohio was technically a state in like eighteen bo two or three or four or something like and that. And I live here and I have no idea. But some shit like went down. Like it wasn't like officially a state. Like we technically did not become a state until 1953. Really? Yeah. Because of some weird technicality. I don't think. I so I, I didn't know if that was before or after Alaska, but Alaska was 1958. Yeah. So. So you're still wrong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I am. I am wrong. <laughs> well, I'm technically not yeah, wrong. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm all right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I'm, <laughs> I didn't know that though. I, I had no idea about sure, Ohio. Yeah. 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 Leave it to Ohio to jump in and out. Yeah. And not have it right. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's around uh, 16 miles south of Seldovia. Oh, right. Seldovia. Right. Yeah, yeah. It is located in Port Chatham Bay, after which an, an adjacent sure. community takes its namesake. Okay. Oh. Named after Nathan- Nathaniel Portlock. All right. Oh, right, right. The town of Portlock was established in the Kenai Pen- Peninsula in the early, uh, early 20th century as a cannery 
particularly mm. for salmon. A salmon cannery. Correct. Do you like salmon? By the way? I love salmon. Yeah, fresh, fresh salmon. Like, like well, seared. Well, yeah, not, I don't like, like canned seared. salmon. Canned salmon is disgusting. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know, know if I've ever had canned salmon. To be yeah, they, they make it. Well, obviously, there was a whole cannery. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> it is thought to have been named after, of course, uh, he's actually Captain Nathaniel Portlock. Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah, a British ship um, captain who sailed there in 1786. Was it on an old, old wooden ship? An old ship? wooden ship. <laughs> it probably was, actually. Yeah, it, back then, yeah. In 1921, a United States post office opened in the town. Oh, well, oh that's, look. Big things. I, I feel like if you can if you can take anything away from from this information, this episode, yeah. just know yeah. that when you get a post office in, as a town or whatever, you've officially made it. Like, if you have an official U.S. post office, you're it, man. Yeah, we just got ours last week. Wait, what? Yeah, the town I'm living in, we just got a post office last week. Homestead Falls? Yeah. You never had a fucking post office? <laughs> of course we did. I don't know, dude. It's, it's a weird a, little fucking town. It's a small here. town. It is. Yeah. It is very. I well, actually, you had to like, go out to Ridgeville or North Homestead or so something? So technically, I guess you'd say that the town I live in does not have a post office because Olmstead Township does not have one. Olmstead Falls, Falls does. Let's see. There you yeah. go. Then. Now who's the asshole? Well, that would be both of us. Anyway, the population largely consisted of Russian, uh, Russian Aleuts, who were indigenous people of the Aleutian Islands. Both the Aleut people and the islands are divided between the U.S. state of Alaska and the Russian administrative division of Kamchatka Krai. Like the vodka? Oh, my God. I didn't Kamchatka? realize that. Yeah, that's Kamchatka. That's a really bad vodka. It's too. also a pretty killer band, actually. Kamchatka? Yeah, I saw them moving for clutch one time. They were fucking killer. I've never heard of them. Kamchatka's horrible vodka. Oh, yeah, it's bottom shelf, yeah. gallon jug. If you guys are drinking bottle. that, please reevaluate your decisions in life. And go buy some voodoo. Yeah, get there you go. We're, ah, voodoo. For those of you unfamiliar <laughs> with a voodoo vodka, the friends of ours own a distillery, and it's probably the best vodka I've ever had in my life. Yeah. So it's pretty yeah, awesome. Yeah. So go check it out. V-O-U-D-O-U-X, because it's magic. <laughs> See that? I throw it in there for those guys. Yeah, still. Why don't you like a fucking voiceover guy? I should be. I you should, should be. Dude. I, yeah. You got the face for it. <laughs> I got the face for radio. <laughs> in the early 1900s, there were a series of deaths and disappearances in the town, which of course is what we are yeah. so curious about. Many people started to blame this on a killer cryptid. Oh. Yeah. I'm not a cryptid. Not, not, a, yeah. not a cryptic. A cryptid. Like cryptocurrency? Would you like to explain what a cryptid is for those listeners who may not be familiar with that? The thing, dude. And there it is. All right. I'm not explaining shit. People should know by now what a cryptid is. <laughs> it is said that this big bad beast <laughs> is the reason behind the town being abandoned and left to become a legend. And it's pretty crazy. So the name is Nantanuk. Something like that. Or Nantanak. It depends on where you look. Right. Yes. But either way, it's. I'm going to say Nantanook for the rest of the uh, episode here. But I'm going to attempt to say Nantanook for the rest of the episode. You can say whatever you want. All it right. doesn't make it right. right uh, correct. <laughs> so let's talk about this guy here, and uh, that is believed to be the cause of How all you know this it's mess. A guy? It could, well, later on they said that it's a guy. Did they? Yeah. They, someone actually says it's a he. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Nantanook is a large Bigfoot-like creature that is believed to be a key factor in the abandonment of the Alaskan fish, fishing village of Portlock. Elders from the nearby town of Naha Nawalak have kept oral traditions of the creature alive since Portlock's abandonment in 1950. Stories differentiate Nantanook from the North American Sasquatch or Bigfoot through its abilities, which many believe to be supernatural and evil in nature. Did I write it out of there? I wrote dun 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 somewhere. You did earlier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I got it. I got you. Okay. I got you, bro. So so basically it's a it's a it's a Sasquatch. Sam Squatch. Sam Squatch, sorry. With uh with like um supernatural telekinetic abilities I kind of thing. So. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the thing with the uh Nantanak is from what I've read, um the uh the, the explanation that we give of, of what it is is kind of what you see wherever you really like. If you just look it up, this is kind of what it is. But I guess it's actually like a little bit different. And this this explanation is kind of what's become the standard explanation for what it is. Right. But it's uh, when you uh, apparently when you really look back into it and you really go back into the uh, um, like the ancestry of these people and like what their beliefs are. It's not exactly 
what it is here, but it's like it was kind of hard to find a lot about it other than what I've written here. So take what we're we're telling you about this thing with a little bit of a grain of salt and run with it. That it <laughs> that too. <laughs> Just uh, run as far as you can. That it seems like this this might be a little bit of like a bastardization of what this creature really was to these people. So it's so basically a. It is. It is. It, you know, everyone can agree that, like, from what I can tell, that it is some sort of like. I guess the original like f- the word that it originally came from and the language that it originally came from kind of meant uh basically it was like almost like a translation to like a like a boogeyman. So, okay. It's something along those lines and it and it's it's weird. It's like kind of a weird thing because there's not a whole lot of documentation about it other than like word of mouth and oral tr- oral history, you know what I mean? So it's a Jedi Bigfoot. Sure. It's okay. Chewbacca. We're going to say that. It's Jedi Bigfoot. It's well, he doesn't really have... He's it, not a Jedi. He's not a Jedi, yeah. I don't know, fucking... He's just a Wookiee. <laughs> the earliest descriptions and accounts of Nantanook can be traced back to European expedition, expedition logs in the 1700s when native Alaskans began inhabiting the Portlock area. Stories and encounters with a mysterious creature began occurring with increasing regularity. In the early 20th century, as Portlock's population grew local and national sources began to record unexplained occurrences in the area. An abnormally high number of disappearances, catastrophes, and deaths eventually led to village elders to just move the hell out <laughs> and head over to nearby uh, Nanwelek. Nen- 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 not going to work here anymore. <laughs> hey! Yeah, there it is. The physical characteristics of Nantanook are typically described to be similar to the North American Sasquatch. Eyewitnesses and historians describe the creature as being upwards of eight feet tall and being covered in dark fur. Sharp claws capable of ripping mammals with ease have also been identified. I love it's how it says, and historians. <laughs> There's some guy that's like, yes, um, George Washington and, uh, you know, Ben Franklin uh, were all great leaders. But uh, let me tell you about the Nantanook. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like well, you believe that, huh? So despite the creature's imposing physical characteristics, many locals identify Nantanook more through its invisible traits. Oh. (laughs) Strange illnesses, smells, and noises have all been recorded in the Portlock area with no known explanation. It could be another guy hiding in a tree that tried to run away and his leg fall off. possible. Just wait for the leg to fall off. Right, exactly. This has led many locals and elders to believe Nantanook is a spiritual being in oh, nature. Okay. Yeah. Hence maybe the boogeyman thing. Correct. So even before Portlock had even existed, there had long been sinister stories told by the natives of the area. They had long told of a creature stalking the wildernesses of the region, Ooh. which they refer to as a Nantanook, uh, roughly translating to half man, half beast. Okay. Okay. Now see, this is where some of the translations get weird because well, I have actually have this pulled up right here. Um, it says that the word is basically, uh, it occurs in the Chugach dialect of, I don't know why I even started reading this, Sugpiak Alutik. I'm sorry, what? Exactly. <laughs> uh, and it says that uh, it's borrowed from the Dinaini Nantina. I'm sure I'm butchering this. This is going that. well, by the way. Uh, yeah, it's going really it, well. It is. Literally translated to those that steal people, and then Ooh, uh, that's even better. Translated in the Denaina dictionary as Nakani boogeyman or woodsman. Okay, well, the woodsman I've heard of. Yeah, that's uh, kind of a known quote unquote cryptid. The woodsman. It's also a badass spider. You ever see a woodsman? Sounds like a really bad porno as well. <laughs> Welcome to the woodsman. So the natives were apparently terrified of these creatures and would avoid any area in which they were known to lurk. Okay, so again, are a lot of these cryptids and stuff created in order to keep people out of places they shouldn't be going? Possibly. You know what I mean? It's like the fucking, what what fucking movie was that? Uh, The Village? Ugh, that damn movie. (laughs) Ugh. So many people love that movie, too. It's crazy to me. It's so bad. Like, I was, I was like, it was a slow burn. And then at the end of it, I'm like, oh, I, I boy. Was, it, was, it was one of those movies that I was, like, legitimately kind of getting into. I'm like, oh, yeah. This could Until be the end. And then, like, I, literally, I just, like, I wanted to break something. You like, want to punch what? M. Night Shyamalan in oh. the face directly, like, pop, right in his Like, mouth. he's great at building up the tension and stuff. And yeah. That, it was just like, dude, I'll, I'll kill you. I'll then, find you and I'll kill you. 
But then there's like this little like, oh, I'm going to put this twist in there. But it's not just a twist. It's like a complete just fuckery of what happened. Oh, Some anyway. of them work and that one did not. Yeah, I was not a fan. I did like, uh, what's the one? Uh, the water one. Um, the Lady in the Water. Oh, Lady in the Water. Yeah, that one was cool, I thought. That yeah, was cool. Was you know. And I was a fan of the uh, uh, Unbreakable. Oh, yeah. Well, that's and, based uh, off a comic glass, book, of course. Glass yeah. And, uh, those are all based off comics. So I love those. What was the other one? Uh, um, um, Split. Split. Yeah. yeah. Those are all cool. Yeah. Those are all super cool. At first, I didn't know that he was actually a part of that because I didn't hate it at the end of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I was like, oh, okay. So, of course, at first, you know, they, uh, you know, it seems safe there here at Portlock. But whether the Nantanook had anything to do with it or not, strange things began happening in and around the area not long after its settlement. Okay. In 1900, a group of hair-covered creatures ran at a prospector who had climbed a tree in an attempt to get his bearings near Thomas Bay. Tree. Then your leg will fall off. And <laughs> I was going to say, maybe that's where the smells came yeah, from. He probably, got stuck see, up there. Again, it's the then... guy in the tree shit. Go back to our last episode and you'll know what we're talking about there. <laughs> the prospector said they were, quote, the most hideous creatures. I couldn't call them anything but devils. Wow. Ooh. Ooh. The prospector, upon seeing the creatures advancing on him, was able to drop down out of the tree, get to his canoe, and make his escape in the nick of time. Good, good on him, man. Yeah, he, he made good it. On him. He had no doubt in his mind that he had not seen the creatures when he did. If he did not see them when he did, that he would, uh, they would have just destroyed him, kicked his ass. Oh, he did. You know, he, oh, he did. <laughs> <laughs> Another bizarre incident allegedly happened in as early as 1905, just a few years after the cannery had actually opened. At this time, many of the workers at the cannery suddenly stopped coming to work and refused to come back. But this wasn't due to poor pay or working conditions, but rather because the men were deeply spooked. Now, question. They said that the, there are strange smells and stuff coming. Is it possible it's coming from the salmon cannery? <laughs> so it's funny that you bring that up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because while, like, I was, while I was researching this, I read that. You know, it was like the whole strange smells and shit. I'm just like, we're going to fucking fish cannery, dude. Yeah. How, can, how can they smell anything other than fucking fish canning? Yeah. It, so apparently this thing must stink really bad. Right, that's going to be horrible. Working in a... Ugh. I can only imagine, man. And it can't have the... It's just 1900s. It can't have the, like, greatest health code restrictions. Oh, no. You know what I mean? No, sure uh, Do you guys... Can you guys smell that right now? I know, you're listening? Like, yeah. Just, can you smell that stench sam- of salmon? Canned in like salmon. in like sixty or seventy degree weather, sitting there. Seventy degree weather. It's fucking Alaska. <laughs> oh yeah, I guess that's true. All right, so never really take though. it back. Yeah, it still stinks. I All mean, right. I'm sure it's I just dude. A salmon cannery cannot. It can't be good. Is all we're saying. It, yeah. it it just cannot be good. At this time, again, many of the uh, the people they they decided, hey, we're not going to go to work anymore. They claimed that there was something in the woods, quote unquote. Commonly reported by the men as being um, large, dark shapes that would stare at them from the tree line at the shore and sometimes display menacing behavior. Oh, my. Just something standing there just looking at you going, <laughs> arr, arr. <laughs> shaking their fist. <laughs> you. <laughs> I'm going to get you. 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 The little one. You. <laughs> You're mine. <laughs> you. Did you guys see that? What are you talking about, dude? It's a tree. No. There's a large dark shape menacing me. <laughs> what? What are you talking about? Look over there. He just told me I'm next. He's just like. <laughs> he had me mugging him the whole time. <laughs> the workers were eventually convinced to come back the following season, but this was not the end of the town's problems. In the 20s and 30s, there were several mysterious deaths in the area that seemed to have been caused by something very large and powerful. The first was a local hunter by the name of Albert Petka, who who was out hunting with his dogs in the 1920s when he came across a massive hairy creature that materialized from the trees to strike him in the chest, sending him flying. Ah. Do we have confirmation where Chainsaw was at this point? No, let's see. He's probably in his mid-40s at this time. So, right? Yeah, like 140. What the fuck? (laughs) Petka's dogs allegedly managed to chase the beast off. Oh, good for them. Right. And when rescuers arrived. Yeah, no, good puppy. Good boy. Yeah. Yeah. When rescuers rescuers arrived, he explained what had happened before dying from his wounds later. All right. So he's laying there in his chest, beat up, and (laughs) it was a big thing. (laughs) You know, yeah. 
I guess that's how they went. Natives at the time saw this as a bad sign. Shocker. Oh. <laughs> I'm shocking. I can't, I can't imagine anyone would be like, heard about that guy that got hit in the chest and died? Good things are happening around here, buddy. Things are going to be good. <laughs> so I'm, uh, on a side note real quick, I'm drinking out of my Yeti, and it's like stainless steel. Oh, yeah. And the ice in it is just so loud. Every time I take a drink, I'm sorry out there. Everyone's like, what the fuck is that noise? He's not sorry. It almost sounds like a cowbell. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> you know, I need some more cowbell. Wow. <laughs> Foo Fighters. <laughs> the Foo Fighters. Anyway, so the natives at the time <laughs> saw it as a bad sign, shocking, and uh, believed it to be evidence that a Nantanook had come to haunt the area. But of course they did. Rumors like this persisted for years, only further perpetuated by stories of miners, loggers, hunters, or cannery workers finding huge tracks what in the do, woods. Why, what do underage people have to do with this? Not those kind of miners. Not n- miners, not minors. I don't understand. ER. Not OR. Emergency room and operating room? Let's keep going. <laughs> or of seeing uh, fleeting oh. large dark shapes and some, uh, sometimes hearing eerie howls <laughs> at night. Were they menacing? They were menacing. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to kill you. Standing in the tree line, shaking a fist. <laughs> Got his thumb against his throat, like doing the whole cut thing. Like, <laughs> Making it even more ominous is that there were some reports from frightened natives <laughs> that there was a ghostly entity in the area as oh, well. Oh, shit, son. Which took the form of a woman wearing a long black dress and who would appear at the top of the cliffs near town to scream and moan before vanishing. Hey! I'm a ghost! <laughs> hey, baby! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an old reference. Oh, there it is. And a great shirt, by the way. Check it out on our shop. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's how, good for the children. How bad is it that not only do they have these uh, Nantanooks floating around, but they also now have they this. Got a, now they got a ghost lady. Yeah, they got a ghost lady that's screaming. Jesus fucking Portlock. Yeah. So Brian Weed is the co-founder hey. of, a, <laughs> of a group called Juno's Hidden History. Oh. That primarily keeps tracks of things. Uh, keeps tracks. Keep <laughs> tracks of the Keeps. I, I keep saying it. Keeps track of things. Through their Facebook page, he has traveled all over Juneau and oh. many other Alaskan towns in search of nas- natural history and stories. Good, okay. dude. That's That should be like, that's what I should do for a living. You should do that. I would be great for that. Isn't that what you were doing when you were gone just a little while kind ago? Kind of. Kind of? But mostly no. <laughs> 99.99% no. No. <laughs> There was that little bit yeah. where I went to like two towns over to find out about this guy that did some stuff. What'd you find out? Nothing. Oh, well. Couldn't find him. That was uneventful. <laughs> it was very. Yeah. So his group plans frequent hikes. Um, and well, They plan frequent hikes in the area, you know, that they're going to or whatever. Yeah. Um, that uh, have some sort of story to tell or just to see the natural beauty of the go. area. You know, go meet up with this guy in Alaska. That'd be cool. Yeah. So he related another story of a mysterious death. And this is quote coming from Brian Weed. Weed. A logger was out working and something or someone hit him over the head with a huge piece of logging equipment. Something that one man couldn't have lifted. Sounds like that porno again. <laughs> the woodsman <laughs> hit her in the head with the logging equipment. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when we go off the rails, buddy. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Mushroom stamp on top of it. Ah, oh, man. If you guys don't know what that is, you should Google it. <laughs> At work. Yes. <laughs> yeah, on your work computer, you should you should Google that. See see how many tweets we get. That'd be great. So um, when they found when they found this man's body, unfortunately, there was blood on the equipment, and there was no way that one person could have done it. Oh my! He was a good ten feet from the logging equipment, so it's not like he slipped, fell, and hit his head. It looked more like someone picked it up and bonked him over the head. <laughs> <laughs> Bonk. Is that the technical term? It, that's what he, it says. Bonked. Bonked him over the head. That's what it, <laughs> that's what it says. <laughs> what is that little that little what is that? Little Blue bunny foo foo. Blue bunny foo foo. <laughs> Hopping through the forest, scooping up the field mice and bopping them on the head. <laughs> oh, I really hope this isn't your first episode listening right now. For everyone else. If it is, it doesn't get any better. Just yeah, remember yeah. that, okay? But for everyone else, you get it. Come on. You do. You get it. So in 1940, it was reported that a search party had been sent out to look for one such missing hunter, oh. which would claim that they had come across his body in a creek. 
oh. mutilated and torn apart in a way not consistent with the bear attack. Oh. Now, how they differentiated that, I don't know. but um, Because I'm sure that they know what a bear attack looks like. Bears probably do certain things. Like with claw marks and like teeth marks? Yeah, or? I'm sure they probably attack in certain ways and go for certain areas of the body or something. I don't know. No, I don't know. I don't know exactly what a bear attack looks like. Not that I want to I suppose know. when you live in Alaska, you've seen your share of bear attacks, though. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, probably like first-hand knowledge up there. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody knows somebody that got hit by a bear. Yeah. Other bodies would reportedly be found as well, apparently oh. washed down from the mountains into a nearby lagoon, with others still discovered washed up on the shores of Port Chatham. All of them ripped apart and maimed as if by some immensely powerful animal. Interesting. At the time, there were so many people turning up at the lagoon dead that it began to truly freak out the locals to the point that they spent much time cowering indoors away from those creepy ass woods. Now, okay. could this possibly have been like a serial killer or so? Because I mean, is, this is one of the points in the show where I have to go full disclosure. Was was what's his name? Richard Hansen. Was he available at the time? Butcher Baker. Maybe. I mean, maybe he was a serial killer up there. So uh, <laughs> he was for real. Yeah. No, I know. He, a, was it Richard Hans? Anyway, go ahead. Uh, so again, this is one of those points where I have to go. I'm, I got to go full disclosure. You know how much I love Bigfoot, and I'm, I'm you know, how yes. much I want this to be true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> In every part of your being. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was, uh, I was looking up a couple of reports, um, and uh, I guess around that time. There, there was a guy who did, uh, he did a bunch of digging, and he was looking into reports of like deaths and disappearances and stuff about that time to see if it matches up with all these reports of bodies washing up and people disappearing. And uh, he could only find like there was like literally like no reports in the newspapers around that time. There was no report like there was only like one or two disappearances, and one of them was from like two towns over. So I don't know, the, I don't know what the validity of, of right. these claims is. Like, exactly, but also, in that time, you got to think, like, the 30s and 40s in Alaska, <sighs> that's super fucking isolated from everywhere else. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, at that time, for so sure. So, you might, we might not know. They don't, you know, aside from what people are telling you, that might be the best information you have to go on. Because, just, just because of, yeah. yeah, you know, 30s Alaska is like, fuck, dude. Yeah. So like, They don't even know how to get out of that state at that point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So. so I don't know, like like I said, I don't know. Uh, the validity of the claims is a little dubious uh, at this point. I, I was unable to find um, too much really backing up those claims. But like I said, 1930s Alaska. And knows? remember, blame the Internet. Absolutely. It's the Internet's fault. That, that's it. 100%. If any of this information's wrong, blame the Internet. Do we have that shirt? Do we make that shirt? Uh, we were supposed to make a blame yes, the Yes, it's on there. Is it? Yeah, it's on I'll there. have to get that one. It says, don't blame us, blame the Internet. <laughs> oh, there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, we can, listen. We we just do this show because you know we want to inform people. But if that information happens to be incorrect via something that we've seen, now we try to double check, like you said, yeah, you look. Yeah, yeah. I we try, try to, to make I sure to, yeah. that someone's not out there trying to like you know pull one over on us, yank our chain, have you? Hey-o. Yeah, you know, just to make sure. But even then, sometimes it's fun. So who cares? You know? Oh yeah. yeah. So by the 1950s, locals were sick and tired of living in fear, so they completely fled the town and left it abandoned. Years later, those, when hunters were menacing shadows, <laughs> those, the- they were done. Ooh! They were done. That damn guy keeps looking at me. That's it. Grab the kids. We're leaving. <laughs> Years later, when hunters returned, it is said that they reported seeing 18 inch long human like footprints with patterns Ooh. similar to a deer or wolf. Okay. Maybe it was Shaquille O'Neal. Maybe he's got a big <laughs> foot. He's got a big foot. I'm pretty sure I could sleep in his shoe. Yeah, probably. You're a yeah. tiny little guy. Yeah, I'm I'm a, I'm a little guy. You're a wee little man. So it says here it says that they reported seeing 18 inch long human like footprints. Correct. With patterns similar to a deer or a wolf. So in other meaning, words, like meaning like uh, like travel patterns. The the track itself. <laughs> right. Okay. Like like where they would go and because you know like deer like you, they have, you have like your deer runs like they always go through like certain areas. They always you can follow tracks like they go up this hill and over this way and they follow the same tracks like all the time. I think that's what they're saying. That like they found these footprints following the same tracks as like the deer and the wolf prints, like following the same same you, tracks. You could be totally bullshitting me right now, and I'd be like, okay, because I know nothing about. No, hunting. I feel I, I I'm, I'm almost positive it. that that's what they're that's what they're referring. I know to. we got some hundred hundred listeners out there. If I'm wrong and I'm sounding like a total idiot right now, please tell me. No, I want to know. But I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that's what they're referring to. So do do wolf are they in the same patterns as as deer? I would assume so because they're probably following the deer. 
Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Former Portlock resident Melania Helen Kell. I know, right? That's where I was. Yeah. Just had the extra R. Come yeah. on. Was interviewed by uh, Naomi Clouda of the Homer Tribune back in October, uh, October of 2009. Oh. <laughs> and said things in Portlock started out well enough, but de degenerated to such a point that the family left their home and fled to now, uh, Nawalak. Now, now we like that. Which is like, I guess word. that's where a lot of the people went. It's like a, like the next town, the town over. over. Yeah. Which could be like 59 miles next to it. That know, is true. Yeah. The family had endured the murder of Melania's godfather, Andrew uh, Kamluk in 1931. Kamluk was the logger who was killed when someone or something hit him over the head. Is that the guy that got hit with the logging equipment? Yeah. Oh, shit. The woodsman. That was the woodsman. The woodsman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor guy. The quote, we left our houses and the school and started all new here in Nawalek, said Kel. Fort Graham elder Simeon uh, uh, K Kvaznikov. Oh, that's close. Go with it. Told of the unexplained disappearance of a gold miner near the village during this time. Quote, he went up there one time and never came back, said Kvaznikov. I feel like that's clear. Uh, no one found any sign of him. Another inter interesting aspect of the Portlock story was relayed to Clouda by an Anchorage paramedic who preferred to remain anonymous. Okay. Quote, in 1990, while I was working as a paramedic in Anchorage, we got called out uh, on an alarm for a man having a heart attack at the state jail in Eagle River. He was a native man in his 70s, and after I got him stabilized with IVs, O2, and cardiac drugs, my partner and I began to transport him to the native hospital in Anchorage. En route to the hospital, the paramedic and the native man, and uh, an loot man from uh, Port Graham, talked about hunting. The paramedic had been to Dogfish Bay and was once stuck there due to bad weather. Quote, this old man sat up on the gurney and grabbed me by the front of my shirt. He got right up to my face and said, did it bother you? Well, with that question, the hair just stood up on the back of my head. I said, yes. Did you see it? Was his next question. I said, no. Did you see it? He said, no, but my brother's seen it. It chased him. Ooh! <laughs> I know, is this the guy that's like menacing with everybody? They're like, get him out of here. All right, so that's pretty messed up, right? We got a killer Bigfoot on the loose up there. Right? S supposedly. Right. Supp supposedly. Supposedly. Oh, sorry. I forgot about the beat. So that's one hell of a story. The town had been abandoned ever since, and sightings continue to this day. In fact, there's actually a TV series about this place called Alaskan Killer Bigfoot. Have you watched this at all? I have not. I just found out about it while doing this research. Okay. And uh, it's new. From what I could tell, it just came out this year. If it's even out yet, it said 20... Or no, it was 2021, so it was last year. Okay. Um, I don't know when it came out last year, but I haven't, haven't watched it yet. But obviously, I plan on going to watch it. I was about to say, you have homework now. Oh, yeah. Yes. It's going to be great. The series followed a 40-day expedition to the area to try and see if they can get to the bottom of all the mystery of the Nanook thing. Yeah, right. Whatever. Moody, it says right here, Moody hasn't watched it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Read the notes, bitch. But I'm sure he'll get high and binge it soon. Yeah. yeah. You got to give yeah. me some of this. Yeah. 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 I got you, bro. All right. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. What am I, the dope man over here? <laughs> dope man, dope man. Oh, shit. Yeah, I'm the dope man. Yeah, boy, we're corduroy. Sorry. If you guys aren't hip to NWA, then we we have problems. So on the also, side of... Oh, also a good less than Jake song. Is it? Dope man, yeah. The cover of the NWA one? It's not the NWA song. Oh, okay. Just it's totally own yeah. different thing. I'll have to yeah, check yeah. it out. So on the side of fairness, we do have to disclose an interview we found. Because the look, as much as we want this, well, as much as I want this to be real. Correct. Uh, you know, we have to, we, we like to try to cover both sides. You got to be fair and impartial, my friend. Correct. That's, that's called good reporting is what that is. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. That's called reporting. Is there what you that go. Is. Okay. There you go. The interview was with a woman <laughs> named Sally Ash. Sally is a uh, Sigga Sigpiak. 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 Exactly. Uh, Sigpiak. That sounds good. Sure. Of Russian Aleut descent. Okay. She has lived in Nawalak. Nawalak. I hate that damn word so much. For most of her life, it continues to speak her native language, uh, Suksun. Her mother was born in Dogfish Bay near Point Chatham. So they're from that area. Let's right. just put, put it that way. That would have been much easier. <laughs> Quote, our people were no, <laughs> our people were nomadic. Went by the seasons. Whatever was in season, they would uh, move from one place to another. They went through Port Chatham, Dogfish Bay, Seldovia, Homer, even to Kodiak. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Portlock was kind of a creepy place, she admitted. They tell us, don't go out on a foggy day. That's when he's walking around. You could run into him and you never know what he might do. The he that she is talking about is their local form of Sasquatch known as Nantanook. Nantanook pronounced Nantanook. <laughs> There's no. a, it's right there. Nantanook, Nantanook. Yeah. That's Nook, not Nook. Is not your typical everyday <laughs> Sasquatch brute. Nantanook is more of a supernatural being, like we mentioned earlier. This is coming from uh, the later uh, the interview here. Yes, yes. Uh, quote, I think he is part human, Sally describes. He lived with people and then didn't want to be around them anymore, so he moved to the forest, away from everybody. He started growing hair, and he looked like a Bigfoot. Scary. So kind of like Moody. Yeah, no, it could be me. I mean, everything about this sounds like you right now. My uncles, my grandfathers, they all talked about him. They tell us they live far away from people. They don't mix with people. Goes on to say, my brother went up to the lake. He was uh, tying off his skiff. He started smelling something really bad in the bushes. So he opened it, moving the branches. Something's going on here. Then he looked in there, and there was a man with his hands in the back way, so turned around. It looked like a man, but he was all hairy, and he looked really scary. So he and our cousin took off running and didn't want to be up there. He wasn't sure if it was a Bigfoot, but there was a horrible smell, she said. Again, do we know where Chainsaw was? Mm, not at this time. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I cannot say nor deny that he was there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, she goes on, quote, I think it's a he. He has been living for a long time, Sally says. Uh-oh. He's old. He's tall. He's strong. He's hairy. It lives in the woods, and you can tell when he's getting near. You can smell him. It, it is. It's fucking it's, it's, <laughs> Dude, we are here solving <laughs> mysteries constantly. Hold on. Where's that? We gotta have chainsaw on the show soon. Nantanuk is just a translation of the word chainsaw. Ah, that makes so much sense yeah. now. Yeah. So my she goes on to say, my mom used to talk about it a lot. She tells stories of the Bigfoot, like in Dogfish area. Her and her brother would talk about how Bigfoot was around. They were getting too close to him, and they would be nice to him, respect him, keep distance. It says they were getting too close to him, and then keep okay, whatever. Yeah. So they were getting too close. They gotta respect it and keep their distance. Okay, gotcha. You know, like, well, yeah. They live with him, but not so close. He moved around. He was quick. Sally served as a translator for her cousin, Melania Kell, during her historic interview for the Homer Tribune in 2009 that has since taken the Bigfoot believing world by storm. Melania told a reporter that the entire town evacuated Port Chatham in 1949 due to this murderous Nantanook. Her story has been perceived as being factual by authors, documentarians, and Bigfoot buffs. Yeah. But... (laughs) <laughs> okay. Scary. Quote, my cousin Melania was being interviewed and we were sitting with her, Sally recalls. Melania kind of made up the story because she was getting tired of people asking if this story is true. So that whole thing that I just read right there was Sally translating for Melania. Okay. Got that? Well, no, the early, yeah, earlier, the stuff you were reading, though, was like, that's, that's like factual about the family. Like, that's not the part she made up. No, no, no. Right, right, right. Okay, right, right. right. Just, okay, clarifying. That's all. Right. So, Melania kind of made up a story because she was getting tired of people asking if the story is true. She made up the story about how Bigfoot was killing people. It wasn't true. Everybody knows that, but it was not our place to say nothing. We all knew, but we couldn't just stop her. We were brought up in the way where we can't tell our elders they are wrong. You hear that, kids? You hear that, you little bastards? So when Aunt Sally is talking about killer Bigfoot, you, you just sh- fucking go. You with shut it. up, all right? You sit back and you go, yeah, that's it. I remember that too. Yes, mm-hmm. that's it. And a quote, and that was her story, Sally Giggles. We knew it. It was me and my sisters and my cousins, and we all just sat there. We couldn't tell her. Don't say that, Melania, because she might get mad at us. We were younger than her, and we were not allowed in front of her to say anything like that. So behind her back, you can say whatever you want, just not to her face. Melania knew that we uh, we knew about her story that she made up, and we all had a laugh about it with her. Sally said the reason for the exodus from Port Chatham was more practical in nature. Well, people would see uh, Nantanook, but that wasn't the reason why people moved um, this uh, this way to Saldovia and Nawalek. So they, she's saying that they're... There were still sightings and people still talked about it, but that's not the reason. That right. That's not why they moved. The town, yeah. right? They moved because of the economy, schools, and the church. There really was no killing of people. Well, you know, I mean, it's disappointing. 
I don't believe it. Yeah. But listen, here at the, the Midnight Train, baby, uh, we're going to stick to the fact that, uh, yeah, there's a killer Bigfoot up there. Absolutely. Right? Right? At least Moody is. You're going to stick by that, right? Fucking A right, I am. Absolutely. The Nantonuk. Yeah. Yeah. The woodsman. The, the, the woodsman walking around with a great big old, just <laughs> smacking people with it. <laughs> Menacing from the court. Ooh! <laughs> just standing there, just holding it. <laughs> just... See this right here? Yeah. We didn't say that he was going to beat them with it, by the way. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> we never said that. So that's fun. But you know what? It's not enough, Moody. No? No. We strive to bring our listeners the best in podcast entertainment right here at the train. And generally fail miserably. I didn't say we su- were successful at it. Oh, I just oh said, okay. I said we, we strive. Yeah, That's, we do. Yeah. We're so sorry. <laughs> we're going to do some of our patented quick hitters here and throw in some more crazy ghost towns. The last one's not necessarily a quick hitter, but the last one's pretty cool. So. Why are you yelling? That's just how I talk. <laughs> All Haven't right. you seen my movies? <laughs> First up, we're off to Italy. Oh, I love Italy. The Never ghost been. town have of you Crico. Been to Italy? I have not. No? I have actually not been out of our country. I haven't been to Canada or Mexico. Shut the fuck up. I swear to God, I've only been to the Bahamas. That's it. And that was on a really horrible... Even when we were on tour, you never went to Canada? Nope, but I have been to every single one of the U.S. states other than Alaska. I think I've only missed Alaska and Hawaii and like one... I think somehow I've missed like North Dakota and Montana. Well, you had to have driven through that at some point in time. I don't think so. Oh, I know we did. I've stopped at all those places. Yeah, literally, the only state that I've not been to is Alaska yet. Because I think the only time I was up that way was, like, the West Coast, but then we came back down before coming back over. Like, we didn't cross the north. Well, you're not missing a whole lot up there. No offense to people that live there. It's just very wide open and not a lot. It's just very, yeah. like, oh, yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, the mountains and stuff are beautiful, you know. Sure. I actually drove out to, uh, or rode my bike out to uh, Sturgis. Yeah. And from Cleveland, boy, was that fun. Um, getting past Chicago, it was beautiful. It was awesome. Oh, yeah. But everything up to Chicago was miserable. Oh, yeah. Ugh. Ugh. Horrible. So, anyway, this is the ghost town of Craco, to be more specific, here in Italy. Mm. Craco is a ghost town and commune in the province of Matera in the southern Italian region of uh, Basilac- uh, Bas- <laughs> Basilicata. Sure. All right. Yeah. Haunted, surreal, and moving, it's not surprising that the Craco ghost town and the beautiful surrounding landscape was chosen as the setting for several movies such as Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, Mm -hmm. which I have never seen, either, and 007's Quantum of Solace, which I have seen because I'm kind of a nerd and I love all those movies. I have not seen the newer James Bond. I haven't seen the brand new one that came out. That's the only one I'm missing right now. Yeah. Uh, Pictures of this place are, it's creepy, dude. Yeah? Yeah. Well, maybe we should post that up on our social so people can yeah. see what it looks like. You know, I'm sick of doing all the work. <laughs> <laughs> the first written evidence of the town's existence shows that it was under the possession of a bishop named Arnaldo in 1060 AD. Wow. The town's oldest building, the tall Torre Normana, predates the bishop's documented ownership by 20 years. So 1040. 1040. 1040, good buddy. <laughs> yes. From now, 1154 to 1168, after the archbishop, the nobleman uh, Iberto controlled the town, establishing feudalistic rule, and then ownership passed on to Roberta de oh, Pietra Pet, uh, uh, Pietro Pertos in 1179. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's, I'm That's sticking good. with it. Yeah. All right. I, I got to have some vindication. Hey, yeah. absolutely. All right. A university was established in the 13th century, which is mind-boggling to me. Yeah. That's just insane. That's the 1200s for you uh, uninitiated. Yeah, the 1200s, and they have a university there. And and we didn't have a country until the 1700s. <laughs> and the population kept growing here, reaching 2,590 in the year 1561. By this time, the construction of four large plazas was completed. Graco had its first substantial landslide in 1600, but, you know, life went on there. And the monastery of St. Peter went up in 1630. Then another tragedy hit. In 1656, this little thing uh, called the Black Death began to spread. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, there was quite oh. a few people that got sick from that. Yeah. And, Several. Uh, um, I'd, I'd say more than a few. Do you remember? I don't know if you remember this, but we did an episode on that. We did. Yeah, you remember that? We, d- we did, yeah. I yeah. do remember that. Do you remember when they were talking about 
flinging <laughs> flinging bodies over the flinging wall. Flinging bodies, yeah, that was that was a thing. It was that like was the first chemical warfare. Yep, yeah. Oh, good. that's so funny. And if you guys want to hear us talk about the uh, Black Death, aka the bubonic plague, go back in uh, to that episode and check it out because it's it's pretty <laughs> fucked up, man. <laughs> we as people, oh boy. Anyway, so but Krako wasn't down for the count. Okay, they weren't ready to leave without a fight. In 1799, the town successfully overthrew the feudal system. Only, wow. only to then fall to the Napoleonic occupation. Jesus. Yeah. In 1815, a still growing Craco was divided into two separate districts. After Italy's unification in the mid 19th century, the controversial gangster and folk hero Carmine Croco, I believe it might be Crocho. So CC in that uh, the the sh sound. I don't fucking know. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. So we're we're gonna say Cro Cro Crocho. <laughs> Carmine Crocho. <laughs> he hangs out with the woodsman. All right. <laughs> I actually did a little bit of uh, um, research into him, and he was basically just like a, uh, he was like a, I, I, yeah, like a plunderer. Like he would just rob people. Yeah, that's what he did. But then he ended up getting involved with, so like a land pirate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was just a, he was, yeah, he was like a folk hero kind of thing. Where like, like a Robin Hood type, dude? kind of like a Robin Hood. Right. Yeah, it's kind of a cool story. There's not a lot of available on him. Yeah. They also called him what was his name? Uh, uh, his one of his other names was, I think it's Donatello. Okay. Yeah. But I could be wrong. It might be Leonardo. So he was a ninja turtle. Or Raphael. <laughs> uh, or, or, yeah, anyway. No, I think it was Donatello was his other, All right. uh, his nickname. Is there enough for a bonus on this dude? I was going to do that today, but there's really not a lot. Okay. The bonus yeah. would be like 10, 15 minutes long. All right. Yeah. You know what? I'll take a look. I'll see if I can find anything. In yeah, if, yeah. I'll see what I can do. Carmine Cracho. In? Or, or Croco. Carmine Cracho. No, maybe it's in a hard seat. The Croco. Woodsman. In the Woodsman. <laughs> this summer. <laughs> Carmine Caraccio and the Woodsman bring you the Notanotic, or whatever it is. Anyway, so Mother Nature had more in store for Craco, this oh little town. All right. Poor agricultural conditions caused a severe famine in the late oh. 19th century. This spawned a mass migration of the population, about 1,300 people to North America. Oh. Yeah, they came on over. Because that's a quick trip over at that yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how they did that. Anyway, then came more landslides. Craco had a series of them, plus a flood in 1972 and an earthquake in 1980. Jesus. They're having a rough time. Over that there. was a shitty place to yeah, build a town. Yeah. Luckily, in 1963, the remaining 1,800 inhabitants were transferred down the mountain to a valley called uh, Craco uh, Peixeira. Okay. Yeah. Craco Peixeira, which probably means like the second Craco. I have no idea. I don't speak Italian. Craco I wish I did. Jr. And for those of you that do speak Italian or have that as a second language, uh, God bless you because. I, I've tried, and I know, like, some stuff, mm -hmm. you know, like, Zuka is pumpkin. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, because my daughter and I, we always say, Bona Note, and it's good night. Sure. And I say, Bona Note Zuka, because I call her pumpkin. Yeah, anyway, that's how I know that. That's, so, whole, that's wholesome. Yeah, thanks. That's Aww. nice. That's nice. Aww. So not everyone was willing to move, however. One man native to the town Resisted the relocation. There's always that one. That's going to be me. Uh, yeah. That would be me. Be like, I ain't fucking leaving. Fuck you. But he lived there for the rest of his more than 100 years. Fuck yeah, he did. At Craco. That's pretty cool. That would be me. I'd be like, you know what? Good. All you leave. And now I got the whole fucking town to myself and I don't have to deal with you assholes. <laughs> That's probably why you live for 100 I years. I would rather take my chances with a fucking landslide than deal with you stupid neighbors yeah. anymore. Hey, I'm staying. <laughs> I got all the pasta I need. <laughs> That's a really horrible accent, every every week. Someone bring him his fucking wine and spaghetti, and there you go. That's all you need. Fuck man, that's all you need. Some houses still hold traces of the life that once was here at Craco. Old appliances, abandoned tools, a lonely chair in the middle of a room where no one will ever sit anymore. I might, uh, other than you. A few uh, uh, facades here uh, still bearing the uh, signs of their past beauty. And what was remained or has remained of their decoration. So in other words, yeah. it's like it's vacated, cool, man. If you look right? at the if you look at the pictures, it's pretty cool looking. It's like it's creepy, but like you could tell that like when this when this place was like like in its heyday, it was probably really fucking awesome, man. Well, I mean, first of all, it's in Italy. Like it's your typical you know like I mean? old like, school Italian. It's all it's cool as fuck. Like man. that place is just gorgeous, dude. Oh my god, I love it so much. Except um it what is it, Venice that's sinking? Isn't that the, I believe that's Isn't Venice in the water anyways. Yeah. Well, it's based off of it, but apparently the, uh, the tides and stuff are rising and like the town is literally sinking. Like, I think it's like a, a, 
inch every couple years or years or something like that. Like I have to all, look more all into the, all it. All the canals and stuff? Yeah, like it's starting to bloop, go under. Uh-huh. There's like a bunch of like the, uh, the government and stuff's trying to figure out a way to keep it afloat. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. City on canals. <laughs> right? Or where landslides and earthquakes and all that stuff happen. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. And of course... Listen, yeah. there are the tales of hauntings that come with most ghost towns. Yeah, yeah. Well, there isn't a lot on a uh, you know the search here for it. If you dig a little bit, you can find some stories of late night expeditions finding some interesting things. There are stories of groups seeing shadow people mm. and apparitions. Mm. People hearing strange sounds, pictures containing orbs, and other anomalies. Okay. But apparently it is a great looking place, right? You said yeah, it's, it's pretty cool awesome. Yeah. yeah, it'd be it'd be awesome to go check it out. Yeah, we have to check that out. Well, maybe we'll post some pictures up so you guys can check it out, or you can just Google it for yourself. You know yeah, how to you do know that. What? Look, look, I'm gonna tell you what I told my kids. I'm sick of doing shit for you. Figure it out yourself. You goddamn helpless motherfuckers. His kids are like four, by the way. <laughs> uh, five. <laughs> Get a job, hippie. <laughs> There's a six and a nine year old too. They can help, right? They can help the five year old. Right? Fuck yeah! All right. Next up is uh, your own goddamn one. <laughs> is this Rhyolite? Ry- I, I believe that's how it's Okay, Rhyolite, Nevada. Ooh. The ghost town of Rhyolite and its remnants are definitely a popular destination among those who like seeking out Nevada's Nevada. Nevada. Abandoned places. Home to many of the town's original and now crumbling buildings, it's a fascinating place to see and think about Nevada's past. Correct. According to the National Park Service, the ghost, this ghost town's origins were brought about uh, by Shorty Harris and E.L. Cross, who were prospecting in the area in 1904. There's a guy. I don't know if it's this one. It might be the last. It might be the last one we talk about. The one dude's got a great nickname. It, it must be the last one. I thought it was this one, but it must be the last one. Is it Dickfer? What's a Dickfer? To pee with, <laughs> silly. <laughs> <laughs> Which reminds me, I have a joke for you later. Oh, sweet. Don't forget it. All right. All right. So they found uh, quartz all over a hill. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. And as Shorty describes it, quote, the quartz was just full of free gold. It was the original bullfrog rock. This banner is a Cracker Jack. Hold on. Hold on. on. I got to go back and do this real quick. The quartz was just full of free gold. It was the original bullfrog rock. This banner is a Cracker Jack. The old prospector lingo is the greatest. (laughs) That's all I hear in my head. Is get a big white like bushy floppy head, like pans hanging off of it. Bushy beard. Ooh, hey, what tarnation. Here's gold in them hills. Fucking slabbing his knee. <laughs> Food around the corner. <laughs> oh my god. So he then declared, quote, the district is going to be the banner camp of Nevada. I say so once and I'll say it again. Ooh. I'll tell you some bitch, I'm the best there's ever been. When Shorty speaks, you listen. That's, I guess Shorty's kind of a badass, isn't he? At that time, there was all there was only one other person in the entire area, Old Man Beatty, <laughs> who lived in a ranch with his family five miles away. <laughs> like, like they don't even know the guy's name. Ah, it's Old Man Beatty. I don't know. That's that's the only guy. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's all you need to know, right? Soon the rush was on and several camps were set up, including Bullfrog. Dude, old man Beatty was pissed. Yeah. It's like, what the fuck? There was also another one, the Armagosa, and a settlement between them called Jumpertown. A town site was laid out nearby and given the name Rhyolite from the silica-rich volcanic rock in the area. Oh. All right. Nice. You got to remember, too, back in the day, especially old, for old, folks. Old, old man, <laughs> old man, old Beatty. man Beatty moved to Krakow in, in Italy, and that's where he, <laughs> yeah, that's he was the one guy that wouldn't leave. All right, that's where he is now. <laughs> right, they, they're trying to steal my damn the son of a bitch. <laughs> you ain't moving me. <laughs> and for those of you who are not from the U.S., um, obviously, um, you know, we had this big boom where everyone moved or so out west. Many, so many ghost towns. Dude. Right. So, you know, they set up the these little rush. towns. Yeah, they set up these towns in around the mines and stuff like that and the and second it was gone they were gone yep so there were over 2,000 claims covering everything in a 30 mile area from the bullfrog district most promising and by claims that's like where you can actually go and if you find something you claim it as yours like that's your spot like that's your mine or that's your the, the vein of ore that you've you know that's your shit you know if i'm not mistaken you have to get a hold of someone in the government to get that notarized saying that it is in fact yours 
Like, have you ever seen Deadwood? I don't, I don't know. No, I have not. Oh, my God, dude. What a awesome great show. Though. What a great, I love great the old, show. I love the Old West shit, though. It's absolutely amazing. And uh, I was really pissed they actually ended it. And then they were supposed to come out with a movie. Didn't? Yeah, they came out with a movie. Uh, I don't. I can't find it anywhere. Oh, it came out like a couple of years ago, I think. Really? Yeah. I got to watch it because it's such a great show. If you guys haven't seen Deadwood, it's especially if you're in like the old, you know, the old shoot 'em up kind yeah, of uh, westerns. Out, I gotta yeah, check that it's out. so great. So, um, the uh, of course the the, uh, the 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 most promising was the Montgomery Shoshone mine. Okay, yeah, which yeah. prompted everyone to move to the Rhyolite town site. The town immediately boomed with buildings springing up everywhere. One building was three stories tall and cost ninety thousand dollars to build. Back then, it was ninety thousand dollars to build back then. Yeah, when was that? Oh, uh, eighteen something or other. This says nineteen oh four. Nineteen oh four. Okay, so ninety thousand dollars. Ninety thousand dollars. Yeah. See how much that was? Ninety. You keep going. I'll All right. Look. So a stock exchange and board of trade were actually formed. The red light district drew women from as far away as San Francisco. Hey there were hotels, stores, a school for 250 children, wow. an ice plant, which is crazy, two electric plants, foundries, and machine shops, and even a miners' union hospital. So this might have been after the fact, but like, ah. Uh, so that's not too bad. Oh, wait, no. I'm going to say 90,000 today is Holy probably going to be, I'm going to say about 800,000. More than that. Is it really? Oh, shit. So the town citizens had an active social life, including baseball games, dances, basket socials, whist parties, tennis, a symphony, Sunday school picnics, basketball games, Saturday night variety shows at the Opera House, and pool tournaments. Killing it. It was about $3 million. Holy Jesus. Wow. Oh, man. Which today is like nothing, though. Well, it's for a building. Yeah, for a big building or whatever. $3 million? Like, there's houses, like, down the street from you that cost $3 million now. Yeah, those bastards. (laughs) <laughs> in 1906, Countess Morajeski opened the Al- uh, Alaska Glacier Ice Cream Parlor to the, the uh, delight of the local citizenry. That place sounds amazing. The uh, Alaska Glacier Ice Cream Parlor. Imagine how nice and cold that ice cream is. Oh, would yeah, be. it'd be so good. Except for not really, because they didn't fucking right. have refrigeration. refrigeration. <laughs> that same year, an enterprising miner, Tom T. Kelly, built, built a bottle house. Nice. Out of 50,000 beer and liquor bottles. Fuck yeah, dude. So he built a house. Out of liquor bottles. Out of bottles. Yep. Now, did he drink? I think that's still there, too. It'd be amazing. Is it really? Because I, I would go a, there I just for that. I know there's a couple of those around that are like uh, bottle houses. Yeah. I would definitely. And I don't know if that's the one that I'm thinking of that's like fairly pop. Yeah, I'm like adjusting. Okay. Sorry. I guess. Yeah. It's a woodsman. My, under, my underpants are riding. It's so the gotta, woodsman. Right up. You know? get your manscaped on? Huh? You got your manscaped on? No, no. I got oh, some other okay. ones on. I got my... Uh, I got my uh, American flag with the eagle on the crotch. Oh, right now. oh boy. <laughs> In April 1907, electricity came to Raya Lake. Hey. And by August of that year, a mill had been constructed to handle 300 tons of ore a day Wow! at the Montgomery Shoshone Mine. It consisted of a crusher, three giant rollers, over a dozen cyanide tanks, and a reduction furnace. I'm assuming cyanide is, is that like clarified or something? I don't know, but that sounds like a very safe operation. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. Cyanide is not something to be messed with. The Montgomery Shoshone mine had become nationally known because Bob Montgomery once boasted he could take $10,000 a day in ore from the mine. It was later owned by Charles Schwab, who purchased it in 1906 for a reported 2 to $6 million. Charles Schwab of the investment company. Correct. That's the same guy, yeah. Yeah, Schwab. There's some famous people in a couple of these. Schwab. 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 The financial panic of 1907 took its toll on Riot Light and was seen as the beginning of the end for the town. Oh. In the next few years, mines started closing and banks failed. Newspapers went out of business, and by 1910, the production at the mill had slowed to 2,466. Wow, this is really, really a- like accurate here. Okay. Slowed to $246,661. And there were only 611 residents in the town. Okay. Okay, so you're talking about spreading all That's, that. Think about that. That's a span of like 10 years. Yeah. It it went from nothing to fucking bow. Yep. To nothing in 10 years. Well, because everyone took it all. It's fucking crazy. If you can't find it anymore, it's gone. That's just crazy. It's like, it, it gone. How those towns just like. Yep. It's so, it was just, oh, it's nuts, But dude, dude that's how so many people got rich, dude. Oh, yeah, overnight. Over, not, over something that literally is uh, found in the earth, 
You just had to get lucky and find it. And that somebody else makes a price on what it's worth. You just had to get lucky and find it. That's it. it. So on March 14th, 1911, the directors voted to close down the Montgomery Shoshone Mine and the mill. In 1916, the light and power were finally turned off in the town. Okay, so would it start? It, it started in 1904? Roughly, yes. Yeah, right? In 1916, they closed it down. Mm-hmm. So 12 years. Yep. Yeah. Today, you can find several remnants of Rhyolite's glory days. Some of the walls of the three-story bank building are still standing, as is part of the old jail. The train depot, which is privately owned, is one of the few complete buildings left in the town, as is the bottle house. There you go. Yep. The bottle house was restored by Paramount Pictures in January of 1925. Whoa. All right. That's awesome. That would have been for, obviously, a movie or something. Yeah, I would assume. we got to figure out what movie that is. Yeah. But not like we would know what it is. It's a 1925 movie. The Woodsman, starring Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> <laughs> and according to, um, you know, uh, to only on your state. Only in your state. Only in There's your state. There's some really cool shit on that. I, I've actually found a lot of cool stuff from that website. Awesome. Yeah. So check that website out. Let them know that we uh, take a lot of stuff from there. <laughs> it also happens to be home to one of Nevada's spookiest cemeteries. After all, nothing says creepy like a ghost town graveyard. Known as the Bullfrog Rhyolite Cemetery, it definitely looks the part of a haunted destination you probably shouldn't it's visit at night. Another pretty cool looking place. Yeah. It look all creepy and westerny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Bullfrog Rhyolite Cemetery was actually shared between the, the, both towns here, Bullfrog and right. Rhyolite, whatever. Home to just a handful of rugged graves, including some that look like nothing more than a human shaped mound of rocks. It definitely has a serene type of beauty to it uh, during the daylight, I, of course, right? Because. <laughs> I'd rather go at night personally, but that's me. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that stuff at all. I actually really enjoy doing that stuff. I used to go and uh, we had a cemetery behind my uh, house, in my mother's house, mm-hmm. and one of the many houses we lived in. But uh, I used to go out there and read all the time in the cemetery. It was just peaceful. Nobody's bothering you there. You know what I mean? Everybody's dead. You know what I mean? Seriously. Like, it's, I'm, <laughs> I'm not trying to make a joke. You know, it's not like people are crowding in there because, you know, like a library or something yeah. like that. It's a, it's just, I don't know, peaceful it's and quiet, serene. Man. Yeah, I loved it. There's no telling what kind of creepy experiences you could have in Rhyolite once the sun sets. In fact, paranormal enthusiasts make, uh, make trips out there um, to do challenges just like that, see if they mm-hmm. find stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, disembodied voices and orbs are often reported in the area. And while most, most of the action seems to be centered on the, uh, this area, there are also reports of the same strange goings uh, in the town itself. So aside mm-hmm. from the cemetery. Yeah, yeah. Strange sounds and voices and orbs, of course, as well as strange shadows and apparitions. Sounds amazing to be out. Kind of want to go out there. Yeah, how far away from Vegas is that? You know? No clue. Okay. Well. I know. Yeah. Next up, we head to Calico, California. Woo-hoo! Calico is a ghost town and former mining town in San Bernardino County, California, United States, right here in the States, located in the Calico Mountains of the Mojave Desert region of Southern California. It was founded in 1881 as, of course, a silver mining town and was later converted into a county park named Calico Ghost Town. Uh, It's only two hours from Vegas. That's awesome. 123.2 miles. I think I'm going to Vegas in October, maybe. (laughs) There you go, man. Rent a car. Get the fuck out there. Yeah, I should go out there and check it out. Hey, man. Located off of Interstate 15, it lies three miles from Barstow and three miles from Yermo. <laughs> Giant letters spelling Calico, C-A-L-I-C-O, are visible from the highway on the Calico Peaks behind it. Walter Knott purchased Calico in the 1950s and architecturally restored all but the five remaining original buildings to look as they did in the 1800s. That's amazing. Yeah, there's. do you know who Walter Knott is? Uh, You're about to find out, bro. All right, well, thanks. Calico received California uh, Historical Landmark number 782 and in 2005 was uh, uh, proclaimed by then Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger to be the California to be California's Silver Rush ghost town. So it's like specifically for the. uh, He's like, listen, I was thinking about it. You know what we need? We need a Silver Rush ghost town. That's a great idea, sir. And stogies. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> in 1881, four prospectors were leaving Grapevine Station, which is now present-day uh, Barstow in California, for a mountain peak to the northeast. After they, they described the peak as calico-covered, the peak, the uh, or as the peak, the mountain range to which it belonged and the town that followed were then called, well, calico. Because, you know, calico-colored. Sure. Why at the not? Cat. If you're wondering what that is, just look at a calico cat, and there you go. 
The four prospectors discovered silver in the mountain and opened the Silver King Mine, which was California's largest silver producer in the mid-1880s. John C. King, who had grub-staked the prospectors. What the hell is, what is grub-staking? I, I don't know. <laughs> gr- gr- <laughs> I don't you try to grub-stake me, John C. King. <laughs> You've seen what I did to that other feller. So anyway, uh, he just... It means... Uh, yeah, well, I don't know what this means. Grub steak is an amount of material provisions or money supplied to an enterprise in return for a share in the resulting profits. Oh, so basically he was paying people to whatever they got, he got a percentage of. Like he would invest in them to, to find what they were looking for? Yeah, it looks is, like is that it. What that's, I mean, that's what it sounds like, right? Yeah. I don't know. So the Silver King mine was thus named after him. Get yeah, it? basically like King. you loan somebody. Like in today's terms, it would be like you're loaning somebody money to launch an enterprise, like to launch a business, and then you get some of the profits for it. Okay. You know? Yeah, cool. Yeah. So um, this guy was the uncle of Walter Knott, who we just talked about a minute ago, founder of Knott's Berry Farm. Oh, there you oh. go. Yeah, that, I, thought Walter, I thought it was Walter Knott was the Knott's Berry guy, but this guy's the Well, that's guy. how he did that. He got that. He got that. He got that grub steak money. He got that gr- the grub steak money. King was sheriff of San Bernardino County from 19 or 1879 to 1882. A post office at Calico was established in early 1882. And of course, like you said earlier, <laughs> get a post you know office, you got a town. You made it, baby. And the Calico Print, a weekly newspaper, started publishing. Oh. Which, by the way, if you if you guys, hopefully, I don't know if you guys know out there how difficult it was to create newspapers back in the day because you had to actually typeset everything Mm -hmm. so you had little end of it if you ever looked at a typewriter and you seen the end of it how the little letters and numbers are in there they used to have to take those they would write it out by hand at first and then they would take that they would put it all together on a big slab like a board a board then they would stamp it with ink and then crank it out like that that is insane to me and here we are with you know computers now that just do everything uh-huh. you can talk you to it, it and tell it what to do you do it on your phone yeah it's insane it's insane i tell you imagine you. what somebody like that guy back then making that newspaper like if he heard like someone like if you could time travel he'd be like what i could do <laughs> he quit He's like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah he'd quit there'd be nothing he'd be God like now nah. damn huh? it so the town soon supported three hotels five general stores a meat market bars brothels but of course and three restaurants and boarding houses that's where the woodsman hung out that's right <laughs> The county established a school district and a voting precinct. Oh. The town also had a deputy sheriff and two constables. Oh, good for that. Two them. lawyers and a justice of the peace. Two lawyers. Yeah. One, one, one for each for side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A prosecutor got, and a defendant. Yeah. Five commissioners and two doctors. Oh, very nice. There was also a Wells Fargo office and a telephone and telegraph service. Oh, man. This place is kicking. At its height of silver production during 1883 to 1885, Calico had over 500 mines and a population of 1,200 people. For two years. Yeah, for two <laughs> <laughs> Two freaking years. <laughs> Local bad men were buried in the Boot Hill Cemetery, and I know all about Boot Hill Cemetery. Yeah, I'm trying to think who was buried there. Hold on. Oh, uh, hold on. There's, there's, um, um, there was a famous outlaw that was married, uh, married there, buried there. Uh, I'll, I'll figure it out. An attempt. But see, there's other Boot Hill cemeteries because there's a Boot Hill Cemetery in Arizona in uh, Tombstone. That's the one I'm thinking yeah. of. All right, all right. Never mind. I take that back. So I know about that one. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, Tombstone, another amazing movie about oh. the Old West. Oh. I'm your Huckleberry. I love that. Oh, yeah. An attempt to revive the town was made in uh, roughly around 1915 when a cyanide plant, more freaking cyanide, <laughs> was built to recover silver from the unprocessed Silver King mines deposits. Is that how they got silver? Was what? using cyanide? I Do I look like a fucking silver miner, do you? Kind of. Yeah, I probably probably do. Walter Knott and his wife, Cordelia, founders of Knott's Berry Farm, were homesteaded at Newberry Springs around this time, and Knott helped build the redwood cyanide tanks for the plant. They're in redwood, meaning they're wooden. Oh, boy. The last owner of Calico as a mine was Zenda Mining Company. After building Ghost Town, um, the ghost town at uh, Knott's Berry's farm in 1940s, Walter Knott, his son, Russell, and Paul Von Kleben, who was Knott's art director, made a road trip to Calico. The three of them came back filled with enthusiasm. If they could build an imaginary ghost town at Knott's Berry Farm, would it not be possible to restore a real ghost town? In 1951, Walter Knott purchased the town of Calico from the, uh, the Zenda Mining Company and put Paul von Kleben in charge of restoring it to its original condition, hmm. referencing the old photographs and whatnot they had around. 
Using these old photos in Walter's memory and that of some of old timers who still lived in the area, Von Kleben was able to not only restore existing structures, but also design and replace missing buildings. Not spent $700,000 re- uh, restoring Calico. Uh, he, um, he installed a long time, or, uh, yeah, he put a long, um, long time friend of his and uh, employee named Freddie Calico Fred Noller as resident caretaker and official greeter. In 1966, Walter Knott decided to donate the town to San Bernardino County, and Calico became a county regional park. The site is now a thriving tourist attraction and is quite interesting to visit, despite uh, neither original nor very atmospheric, as only about four of the buildings are largely unchanged from the mining area, and the whole place is rather commercialized. Some of the replica, replica houses uh, have only a frontage as part of a movie set, so it only has the front part to it. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of like a Blazing Saddles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the best part... Town. Yeah, yeah. The best part, of course... Is that it's haunted, right? Uh, that would be the best part. Yeah. You can take ghost tours through the town to find out for yourself. According to hauntedrooms.com, which is amazing, there's a website called that. Yeah. Amid the claims of paranormal activity, there are three main entities who have been identified as residing in Calico Ghost Town. And these are the ones that visitors should be on the lookout for. One of the most commonly spotted entities haunting Calico Ghost Town is said to be a woman by the name of Lucy Lane. History suggests that Lucy ran Calico's general store alongside her husband, John Robert Lane. Just like so many of the residents, the uh, the Lanes moved away from Calico when the town began uh, rapidly depopulating. However, they ended up returning in 1916 after the town was abandoned and lived the rest of their days in the town. Lucy was well into her 90s when she finally passed. I'm lo- I love hearing that these older people are living so long. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. It seems only natural that uh, you know she would want to stick around in the town where she lived and died. Visitors to Calico Ghost Town have frequently reported seeing Lucy walking between what was once her home and the general store. She is easily recognizable by her attire, the beautiful black lace dress in which she was buried. Remember we talked about another woman earlier that was in a black dress. Mm -hmm. Although most of the reports describe seeing Lucy Lane walking from her home to the general store, there have also been sightings of her inside both buildings as well. Her former home is now a museum dedicated to Lucy and John Robert Lane, and she is sometimes seen sitting in a rocking chair, slowly rocking back and forth. Some visitors also claim to have seen Lucy behind the counter in the general store. That's amazing. Hey, Lucy, I'm home. (laughs) You guys are explaining to you. Why do you keep haunting everyone, Lucy? (laughs) Another of the paranormal hotspots in the Calico ghost town is definitely the schoolhouse, but why not? Yep, fuck that. Dude. Yep, you don't like those kid Fucking ghosts. Ghost kids you don't like it. Yeah, fuck off, You dude. definitely don't like it. The names of the teachers have long since been lost, but it's said to be their spirits who are responsible for the plethora of paranormal activity happening in the old schoolhouse. What is a plethora, jefe? It's a lot. <laughs> so, it's Never mind. I know what it is. There are frequent reports that the teachers like to stand in the windows of the schoolhouse, peering out at those passing on, on, by on the oh outside. Oh, God, that's creepy as fuck. Yeah, that would be, yeah. Well, it's the teachers. The teacher's doing it. Oh, okay. Yeah, not the kids. There are also Good. reports of a red ball of light moving around inside Ooh. the schoolhouse. This phenomenon has been witnessed by many visitors to the <laughs> ghost town. Phenomena. <laughs> <laughs> the ball. <laughs> no, phenomena. God, you miss everything. I know. The former teachers are certainly not the only ones who are up to mischief. There have also been reports of various uh, ghostly students. Fuck you. In the schoolhouse as well. These children's spirits can be seen flitting around inside the building. They can fuck right off. <laughs> they do seem to keep themselves to the or keep to themselves most of the time. But there is one girl aged around eleven or twelve who is far more outgoing. Mm. However, she is more likely to appear to children and to teens who will often comment on seeing her only for their parents to turn around and the girl to be gone. Good. Good. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> the most prominent ghost that roams around Calico Ghost Town is probably the entity known as Tumbleweed Harris. Tumbleweed Harris. Shee we. He is actually the last marshal of Calico, and oh. it seems as though he has not yet stepped down from his duty. <laughs> it's my town, bitch. You just hear like his, uh, what are those? The, the ching, the ching. Spurs. Like walking the spurs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's Tumbleweed. Tumbleweed's coming. So he is often seen by the boardwalks on Main Street, and you will be able to recognize him by his large frame and long white beard. But if you do visit Calico Ghost Town, be sure to stop by Tumbleweed's gravestone 
and thank him for continuing to keep Calico's peace even in death. Do you think the kid, the ghost kids, fuck around with Tumbleweed and he's just like, get off my lawn! <laughs> I've been here forever! <laughs> Damn it! And finally, listen. Well, yeah. first of all, before I go on with this, that actually sounds awesome. Yeah, and I guess it's like a pretty cool town. Like, yeah. it looks like it's all, it's it's pretty jazzed up, man. Jazzed? Yeah, you can go out there and hang out, and you got some hotels, and you can stay and eat some foods and stuff. But see, the other place, the one before this sounds more yeah, I like, like the authentic. Shit, man. Yeah. yeah, I like, I want yeah. that. I don't want to go someplace where I can look they over. Turn this, a, they, this Calico is like, definitely like a tourist. Right. A touristy place. If there's now. a Starbucks there, I'm out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that, you've just ruined it for me. I'm not doing that. Yeah, Wait, Even, I love Starbucks. You mean there were no Starbucks back in the day? <laughs> uh, no. To be fair, I fucking hate Starbucks. Starbucks. Really? Their coffee is disgusting. See, I actually like it. <laughs> yeah, but I have to like juice it up though. It I gotta like, get like it tastes like poop. But I drink like you know espresso all day long, so which is probably why I sound the way I do when I'm on here. Wee! <laughs> and I noticed you were a little jittery. Today. Oh yeah, oh yeah, lots of coffee. And finally, we double back and head back to Alaska Yay! for one more ghost town. I think this is the one that guy had a great nickname. So Kennecott, Alaska, <laughs> is our final destination. Yeah. In the summer of 1900, two prospectors, Tarantula Jack Smith <laughs> there it is. and Clarence L. Warner. <laughs> Tarantula Jack. I was dying reading that. I don't know why it's so funny to me. Now, ladies and gentlemen. How do you get that nickname is what I want to know. Children, I want you to sit down. I have a story to tell you <laughs> about a man named Tarantula Jack. <laughs> now, rumor has it that he got his name because one day he was out in the woods and nature had come calling. As he had bent down, a tarantula jumped him and got him right on the throat. <laughs> I don't know if that's how they went or not. So anyway, they were a group of prospectors <laughs> associated with the McClellan party. They spotted a, quote, green patch far above them in an improbable location for a grass green meadow. The green turned out to be malachite, located oh. with uh, chalcokite. I don't know, which is uh, it's called copper glance. Sure. All right. And the location of the Bonanza claim. Bonanza. A few days later, Arthur Co. Spencer, U.S. Geological Survey geologist, independently found calcite, a calcite or calcite, one of the two, at the same location. I'm assuming that's some big deal. Maybe it's a combination of the two, and it's calcite. That would have to be what it is, right? Calcites. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Stephen Birch, a mining engineer just out of school, was in Alaska looking for investment opportunities in minerals. Which like, don't aren't we all? <laughs> I, mean, I know, right? Right. I know when I went when I got out of school, man. That's all you're worried about, my, dude. My dad's like, "You gotta go to college." I'm like, "I'm gonna invest in minerals, Dad." Right. That's... You can't do anything about it. <laughs> and look at you now. <laughs> he had the financial backing of the Havemeyer family <laughs> and another investor named James Ralph. Oh, see, that's where I went wrong. I didn't have the backing of the Havemeyer family. Right. From his days, you know, back in New York, Birch spent the winter of 1901 to 1902 acquiring the McClellan Group's interests. For the Alaska Copper Company of Birch, Havemeyer, Ralph, and Schultz. <laughs> Sounds like a really bad <laughs> law, law office. I know, right? Dude. Welcome to the law offices of uh, Birch, Havemeyer, Ralph, and Schultz. <laughs> Welcome to the law office of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. <laughs> Later to become the Alaska Copper and Coal Company. In the summer of 1901, he visited the property and, quote, spent months mapping and sampling. He confirmed the Bonanza mine and surrounded uh, the surrounding deposits were, at the time, the richest known concentration of copper in the world. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. By 1905, Birch had successfully defended the legal challenges to his property, and he began the search for capital to develop the area. Of course, he needs money. On June 28th, 1906, he entered into an amalgamation with Daniel Guggenheim and J.P. Morgan. Boosh. Known as the Alaska Syndicate. Oh, that sounds awesome. That Guggenheim, like the fucking museum? I would assume. Yeah, I mean, you got J.P. Morgan and you. Okay, so this is back in the early 1900s. This is when they were just getting their shit going. They're just getting started. Of course, they're going to try and jump into any investment. And you got the biggest (laughs) copper mine in the world. It's crazy how you not mine, but copper. Like that dude's come up in a lot of our episodes when we talk about shit like this. But if you go back, like we've talked about J.P. Morgan numerous times. Oh, there is a huge conspiracy about J.P. Morgan and oh, his yeah. entire legacy. Dude, he had something to do supposedly with the Titanic sinking and yeah. all that shit too. Yeah. There's a lot. That'd be a good bonus yeah. to talk about the J.P. Morgan conspiracies. Yeah. So the um, uh, of course this is called the Alaska Syndicate, eventually securing over thirty million dollars in the early 1900s. <laughs> to establish this. I'm going to say it. right now that's got to be like a billion. So we'll say what? Like 19 what? It's 1906. 1906. Yeah. $30 million in 1906. Yep. 
The capital was used or was to be used for constructing a railway, a steamship line, and development of the mines. In November of 1906, the Alaska Alaska Syndicate bought a 40% interest in the Bonanza mine from the Alaska Copper and Coal Company and a 46.2% interest in the railroad plans of John Rosine's Northwestern Commercial Company. You guys are probably like, what the hell does that have to do with anything? That's Mm -hmm. just a lot of money that did a lot of stuff way back in the day. Political uh, battles over the mining and subsequent railroad were fought in the office of U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt between conservationists and those having a financial interest in the copper. The Alaska Syndicate, which sounds like a mob group, traded its Rang- uh, Rang- Rangel Mountain Mines assets for shares in the Kennecott Corporation. And um, in April of 1915, a similar transaction followed with CR and NW Railway and the Alaska Steamship Company. So they were actually building railway companies, steamships. This, this this city was a major, major city. This Basically, this place put Alaska like on the fucking map. Yeah, I mean, that's crazy. You figure um, out what it was? Yeah. <laughs> I did. Yeah. $30 million in 1906 is roughly a billion dollars today. That's why I said, hell yeah. That's- $958,346,666.67. Pocket change. A fucking bi- dude was a billionaire in 1906. Yeah. Well, it's pocket change to Elon Musk, who's now buying Twitter, apparently. I saw that. For, what is it, $44 billion? Something Or like $48 billion. <laughs> So Kennecott Mines was named after the Kennecott Glacier in the valley below. The geologist Oscar Ron, Roan named the glacier after Robert Kennecott during the 1899 U.S. Army a- Abercrombie Survey. A, quote, clerical error resulted in the substitution of an E for the I, supposedly by Stephen Birch himself. What a dick. Yeah, you know, I don't know, just saying. Well, can't be mad at it, right? I mean, whatever can be in 1916, the peak year for production, the mines produced copper ore valued at thirty two point four million dollars. That's over a billion dollars. Billion dollars. Right. So that's for the year for one year. Yeah. In 1925, Kennecott, a geologist, predicted that the end of the high grade ore bodies was in sight. Okay, Uh So this is nine years later. The highest grades of ore were largely depleted by the early 1930s. The glacier mine closed in 1929. The mother load, okay, was the big one, was next, closing at the end of July of 1938. The final three, Erie, Jumbo, and Bonanza, closed that September. The last train left Kennecott on November 10th, 1938, leaving a ghost town. So everybody got that. They came in, basically raped the land, and then took off. That's it. From 1909 until uh, 1938, except when it closed temporarily in 1932, Kennecott Mines produced over 4.6 million tons of ore that contained 1.183 billion pounds of copper, mainly from three ore bodies, the Bonanza, Jumbo, and Mother Lowe. The Kennecott operations reported gross revenues over $200 million and a net profit greater than $100 million in 19, so, early, early 1900s money. So $100 million? Uh, their, profit? their net profit was greater than a hundred million. So that's got to be. Shit, well, I mean, if dude. thirty million's a billion, so you're looking at three billion dollars, roughly, right? In 1938, Ernest Gruning proposed Kennec- uh, Kennecott be preserved as a national park, a recommendation by President Franklin D. Roosevelt on January 18th, 1940, for the establishment of the Kennecott National Monument went nowhere. <laughs> However, on December 2nd, 1980. It saw the establishment of the Wrangell St. Elias National Park and uh, Preserve. From 1939 until the 1950s, Kennecott was deserted except for a family of three who served as the watchman until about 1952. That's crazy. So just you and your family, like a, a, a wife, a husband, and a daughter or a son are just living there for almost 20 years. That's insane. Yeah. In the late 1960s, an attempt was made to reprocess the tailings and to transport the ore in aircraft. The cost of doing so made the idea unprofitable. Around the same time, the company with land rights ordered the destruction of the town to rid them of liability for potential accidents. So let's wipe it out, right? A few structures were destroyed, but the job was never finished and most of the town was left standing. Visitors and nearby residents have stripped many of the small items and artifacts. Some have since returned and are held in various archives. That's crazy that it brought that much money the, uh, out if you yeah I, so i looked on there really quick and depending on what year you do it anywhere between uh like the, the 1906 to like 1930 uh it's it's somewhere between two to three and a half billion dollars that they made in net profit that's profit that's just profit yeah that's profit oh so my that's, god yeah. and uh 
Dude, the pictures of the mine that's still open, it's a 13-story mine. It's like takes the whole side of this fucking mountain up. Jesus. It's fucking cool as shit. That's awesome. So, of course, you guys out there know that we love our history. And we just thought it was cool, you know, because this is such an important town in Alaska's history yeah, and, and the United States' history. Yeah, in yeah. general, yeah. Just because of all that. It's, it's it was fucking cool. Right. And then immediately, just uh, gone. Gone. Boom. That's it. But, you know, that's uh, that's not exactly why we're there. You're back in Alaska. Why are we? Well, because it's also... Haunted. Did that work? Did that work? It was good. Kind of. Actually, <laughs> so reports of paranormal paranormal activity along uh, the abandoned train tracks. Bless you. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Abound Sorry. and have for decades. But of course, that's not all. That's not all that makes it one of the most haunted places in America. Some claim to have seen old tombstones along the route. The gravestones then vanish by the time the visitors make their return trip. That's mm. that's new. Mm-hmm. That's new. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Others have reported hearing disembodied voices and phantom children laughing. Here you go, buddy. <laughs> hey. <laughs> that is the one thing that just freaks me the yeah, fuck out. Yeah. I hate it. Yeah, I think you like it. I don't like living kids. Oh. Okay. Why would I like ghost children? <laughs> Reportedly, a 1990s construction project here halted after workers were scared away by spooky sounds and inexplicable events. Yeah, I'd be fucking gone, dude. Yeah. So like, hey, there's ghost kids in there. I'd be like, nope, fuck you. I'm not doing it. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. So, all right. One little last little tidbit of fact here. Tidbit. There's, there's actually a little town, and this really doesn't have a whole lot to do with it other than Alaska. There's a little town up in the far northwest territory of Alaska called Diomede, which is located on the island of Little Diomede in the middle of the Bering Strait. During the winter months, the water can freeze and you can actually walk to Big Diomede, which is an island in Russia. The stretch of water between these two islands is only about two and a half miles wide. There are two reported cases of people walking from Alaska to Russia in modern history. The last were Carl Bushby and his American companion, Dmitry Keffer, who in 2006 walked from Alaska to Russia over the Bering Strait in 14 days. Wow. I just thought that was kind of cool. And then it melted and they got stuck in fucking Russia. <laughs> They're like, what are you doing here? How'd, how'd you get here? <laughs> we, we walked. Americans. So think about that, though. Like, we can literally... Russia from the United States is technically only two and a half miles away. It's walkable. It's walkable. And it's, it's been done. Depending on where you're at, yeah. Yeah. So there you have it. Killer Bigfoot and some cool haunted ghost towns with a lot of history in there. And some cool history. Yeah, man. And maybe we'll, uh, you know, drive into some more ghost towns, take this train right into some more ghost towns in, you know, some future episodes. Yeah, what do you, what do you absolutely. Think? I think right? it'd be fun. Yeah. And now, boys and girls, it's your favorite part of this show, the movie review. Which top 10 movies will make the cut today? For you uh, listeners out there that may not know, Moody and I actually dance to that song every time we, we go yeah. into the movie segment. Help it. Yeah. Got our finger up doing the. <laughs> Charleston. The Charleston, yeah. <laughs> the Charleston. Hi, cat. Hi. <laughs> so today we are talking about the 10 most ferociously fun Bigfoot horror movies as per filmschoolrejects.com. That's yes. a new one. All right. Yeah. I'm going to have to check into that a little more. I've uh, Ever since I looked up that, I, I keep getting them on my like, notification, like my little uh, homepage or whatever. Okay. And uh, like a bunch of articles from them. There's actually some pretty cool shit on there. All right. So everyone out there, get your pen and paper because we want to know which ones you've actually seen and or heard of. And we're also going to see. I think I've seen like two on here. That's it? Yeah. Oh, wow. I thought it was going to be way more. I never even heard of half of these. All right. We're going to go through these and see. Well, number 10 is Return to Boggy Creek from 1977. I've seen this one. Have you? Yes. I haven't heard. I haven't seen this one. Bigfoot horror movies are already. I know of this one, but I've never seen it. It's awesome are already a subgenre unto themselves, but there are various subgenres as well. One that we don't really see much of these days is the folktale style that treats the legend as true and the locals as believers. This follow-up to 1972's monster hit, The Legend of Boggy Creek, have you ever seen I've, one? I've heard of that. I've okay. heard of both of those. I've never seen them, though. Keeps the same tone and style to deliver a suspenseful tale of Bigfoot creeping out the populace and audiences alike. It's low-key compared to most other Bigfoot movies, but it features some effective sequences of tension and terror alongside appearances by TV's Don Wells and Dana Plato. Remember Dana Plato? She did. She was in, uh, it was a different strokes. Yes. She yeah. was the sister in she different strokes. Yeah. 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 She's dead though. Which you want to talk about conspiracies. Yeah, Holy boy. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. 
So it won't knock your socks off, but consider it a gateway horror movie for kids who like Harry and the Hendersons because the Beast, while spooky, also saves some kids from bad weather. Oh, very nice. I loved Harry and the Hendersons. It's, it's definitely on this Fuck. list. It has to well, be. Oh, no, it's not a horror movie. Oh, yeah, I guess it's not. Yeah. Yeah, it's still great. Oh, it is a great movie. They better not try to redo that one. I'll be so upset about that. All right, yep. number uh, nine on our list is Creature from Black Lake from 1976. A great oh, year, by the way. Never heard of it. Great year. Never heard of this one either. A mysterious creature is stalking the swamps of Louisiana. Ooh. This prompts two city slicker college students to travel down south and investigate the murders. They have a difficult time getting the locals to talk about the Sasquatch, but it doesn't take long until the legendary monster finds them. Finds <laughs> them. I heard you were looking for... Ooh! <laughs> 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 While the movie could use more shots of the monster, Creature from Black Lake is a gem that's ele- elevated by some likable characters and an abundance of charm. The film also has a spooky atmosphere that really captures the mood of the swamp, which is the strongest quality overall. All right. Yeah. Check that one out. Number eight is The Capture of Bigfoot. And the picture I'm seeing from 1979 here doesn't give it a whole lot of uh, credence here. Um, look at. <laughs> oh my. God. It looks like one of the Planet it's of the Apes movies. Yeah. That's hilarious. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's see. That's the capture of Bigfoot. Um, as they say in the X Files, I want to believe the hairy missing link is out there somewhere. With my fingers and toes cro- crossed, I watched every Bigfoot movie caught in desperate hope. This is a flick that will keep the spark of imagination and wish fulfillment lit within. Capture of Bigfoot is not a good movie, <laughs> <laughs> but its director Bill Rubain is a believer. So the guy actually believes in it. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. amazing. Uh, let's see Lloyd Kaufman. Whoa, what? Yeah, it says uh, Lloyd Kaufman considers this to be one of the worst oh. films his Troma Entertainment ever distributed. It's oh, that's Troma. a Troma. Yeah. Oh, awesome, dude. And that might be true, but the capture of Bigfoot is a damned earnest experience. Look, dude, if you're saying that that's the worst movie that Troma ever put out, right. that's fucking saying something. Yeah. Uh, number seven, Primal Rage from 2017. I've seen this one. I have not seen this one. I've seen, well, okay. I've seen, like, this is one of those ones that I watched in parts. Like, I've caught pieces, parts of it. So it's like, I've seen it, but I've never sat down and watched the whole thing all the way through. It says, uh, let's see, it follows a married couple road tripping through the Pacific Northwest when they are uh, unex- unexpectedly sidelined by a Squatch encounter. Mm. The film is the d- uh, directorial debut of special effects artist Ma- uh, Patrick McGee, whose skill has been on display in such films as Alien vs. Predator and Spider-Man. That's cool. Mm-hmm. As one might expect, the special effects, creature design, and makeup are the film's strong suits. Yeah, the creature's pretty cool in that one. Yeah, so everyone else consider this your warning. Okay, there you go. It's not. It's, it's like so. Like I said, I haven't sat through, watched the whole thing all the way through, but it like I want to. It, it, it's decent. I mean, it, you get what you get out of it, but it's it's not bad. You have to check it out. Uh, number six is 1988's Demon Warp. <laughs> nope. What does that have to do with fucking Bigfoot? I don't know. It says, "What if I told you there was a film in which Oscar winner George Kennedy attempts to track down Bigfoot, only to have the creature sneak up behind him and smash his head into a rock?" Who the fuck is George? Uh, he he won an Oscar? An actor from the 70s, I guess. That motherfucker. <laughs> and what if the Bigfoot in question was more of a warefoot with a knack for stealing electronics? If that sounds confusing, don't worry, because the, the movie also contains aliens and one zombie-like being that does a wicked Jack Nicholson impression. Oh, that guy. He's in fucking uh, Naked Gun and shit. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. all right. Oh, and religion seems to be pulling all the strings. Also, this movie sounds fucking amazing. Obviously, I'm talking about Demon Warp, and it's even better than it sounds. That's what this guy says about it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. Hold on. Number five, 2014, Exists. It's just called Exists. I have not seen that one. Uh, most Bigfoot movies go through the same motions. People go into the woods. The woods wind up uh, having Bigfoot in them. Chaos ensues. Exist doesn't break any new ground in either found footage genre. Oh, it's a found footage one. But for what it is, it's a pretty good time if you know what you're getting into, which is to say 90 minutes of dumb dumbs getting absolutely wrecked by Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. What Exist does bring to the table is something resembling suspense, which is more than some of its peers can say. Exist is the answer to the question of what if the... Uh, the titler witch of Blair Witch Project was Bigfoot. And if you're down for a certain flavor of silliness, it's a pretty rad bait and switch. And with one half of the Blair Witch brain trust behind the camera, oh, okay, you know what you're paying for. All the found footage Bigfoot movies, and I'm told there are a lot of them, exists is shockingly decent. So if you like found footage and you like Bigfoot, congrats, they made a movie just for you. <laughs> All right, there you go. I hate found footage, but I might check that out anyways. Number four is Cry Wilderness from 1987. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, no, not here. Much like the road to hell, Cry Wilderness is paved with good intentions. 
predating Harry and Henderson's by a few months, this deliriously watchable take on the Bigfoot legend is an unap- unapologetic riff on Amblin, uh, Amblin Entertainment's whimsical 1980s fair, despite sharing more similarities to E.T. than uh, Jean Picard Simone's The Pod People than anything Steven Spielberg produced. Sure. Yeah. All right. There you go. Number three, Night of the Demon. I've seen this one. 1980s. I, the de- I feel like I've seen this. What does that have to do with Bigfoot, though? It says, remains the, the most purely entertaining of the Bigfoot horror movies for one simple Wait, reason. I must be thinking of a different movie. It's then. gloriously and gorily bonkers. I must be thinking of a different movie. Like Demon Warp above, this absolute goddamn gem of a film <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> unleashes a plot that starts as a straightforward Bigfoot thriller before shifting into an utterly absurd and massively fun back half. There you go. Yeah. Number two, Abominable. From 2006. This I've seen. Abominable. Is yeah. This the one? Yeah, I think I've seen this one. Uh, genre cinema has uh, has seen all manner of riffs on Alfred Hitchcock's um, Rear Window, but this is the only one to feature Bigfoot. Yeah, okay, I've seen this one. That's really all you need to know, but just in case, please trust me when I say this tale of wheelchair-bound witness to Bigfoot's rampage delivers the goods. It's bloody as hell, makes time for some silly TNA, and mm. affords 80s, 90s staple Matt McCoy as a rare lead role. Monster looks pretty great, too, which isn't something you can say about most Bigfoot movies. Yeah. Number one on the list. Any idea? No. 2013's Willow Creek. I've heard of this one. I haven't seen it, though. Well, it looks like found footage. There are plenty of lackluster... Yeah, it's found footage. Uh, lackluster for, uh, found footage horror films, and there are more than a few dud Bigfoot films, too, but somehow, in combination, the two subgenres are capable of creating the perfect movie cocktail. Willow Creek is not only a prime example of a Sasquatch found footage uh, film that delivers on both counts, but it's also a treasure trove of fun for true fans of the cryptid. Hmm. In it, Sasquatch enthusiast uh, Bryce Johnson takes his skeptical girlfriend, Kelly, there's always the skeptical one, to the small northern California town where the real-life famed Patterson-Gimlin footage was filmed. Okay. Okay. Relationship issues are realistically hashed out. A real-life tourist spot is lovingly portrayed, and when nighttime rolls around, the Squatch hits the fan. (laughs) <laughs> Willow Creek lands is the best of the Bigfoot horror movies because it is uh, it is as interested in the myth t- uh, making aspect of Bigfoot as the reality. It right. builds a foundation of intensity intensity upon first person accounts and warnings from spook townsfolk. Nice. Then drives it home with an unrelenting real time finale. Nice. There's also a movie uh, called uh, The Man Who Killed Hitler and then the Bigfoot. Yes. Uh, have you seen that? Uh, that is. Uh, I know who's in that. Is that uh, is that the Sam? Sam Elliott. Sam Elliott. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that any good? Uh, I've only, I haven't seen the whole thing, so I, I've only seen like half of it. I can't believe they got Sam Elliott in there for that. I've, I've heard good things about it though. Like, like I said, I haven't seen the whole thing, so. Sam. Um, Sam Elliott. I got to get yeah. his voice down. He's, he's very, he's very good, deep. Good luck with that, dude. Very, very deep. Very, that's it's got a seventy-five percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Is that better? <laughs> It's not better. So listen, make sure to stop over to our official website, themidnighttrainpodcast.com. And at our website, you can buy some super sweet, super sweet merchandise. You can wear shirts that promote your second favorite podcast. It's us. We're, oh, we're America's second favorite podcast? We are America's second favorite that's podcast. That's a great like, tagline. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I accidentally made it up today, but that's Look, us. We know that you're. We know that we're nobody's first. <laughs> right. But we're definitely, we're your, definitely second. your second. That's right. So get on over there. That that's a shirt. Oh we're man, like, that's we're like one. the middle child of right. podcasting. Right, we are. And that's and we'll take that. I'll take your second favorite. I don't care, <laughs> dude. That's got to be a shirt. America's <laughs> second favorite podcast. All right, I'll work on it. Do me a favor, text it to me. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So anyway, over there you can get some cool shirts, some uh, iPhone cases. You can get all kinds of stuff. But just you know, you can rep some uh, midnight train stuff. Uh, under uh, mm. ladies, I think. Oh, I do believe. Very nice. Yes, which are, you own two pair, right? No. <laughs> also, listen, you can. Go over there to our website, yes. click on sponsors, and you can help us okay. by going and telling our sponsors that we sent you. Yeah. Like Dr. Squatch Soap. <gasps> Dr. Squatch is changing the way men approach hygiene by providing all natural, high quality, healthy products. And listen, man, they are great. They're so awesome. Uh, you can get 20% off your first subscription. Just head on over there and uh, click on the Midnight Dream Podcast.com forward slash sponsors, which is, you know, there, and just click on the promo code. And uh, you get the, all kinds of cool soap. They got good stuff. Yeah, dude. They actually got some new, um, a new um, promo thing they're going to be going on. So I'll be having that here soon too, as well. Yeah, yeah. We'll have a new one here. Awesome coming up. And cool, also cool. Manscaped. Mm-hmm. Get yourself some Manscaped. Get your 
favorite man in your life some manscaped or ladies and even you could probably use it too yeah dude it's, you, yeah absolutely you, you can clean up the, uh, the the undercarriage a little bit with absolutely. it absolutely you know what i mean why not yep you know and it's amazing stuff and you can actually get uh 20 uh, off and free shipping over there yes sir by going to manscaped.com and just uh using the code accidental yes that's it that's all you got to do yeah it's good stuff it is I good got stuff. mine it's great yeah it's great i love it if you like what you heard from us do us a favor consider being a producer of the show all right we're It'd not sure why. Awesome. But okay. Because we're their second favorite podcast. <laughs> Dude, the best part about that <laughs> is like, because it doesn't matter who's first. Right. It doesn't. Like, it could be like, oh, well, I wonder who, like, like you're not claiming to be the first. So there's no way that it could be like number, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, yeah, we're America's second favorite podcast. Exactly. We're, we're, it doesn't matter who's first. It doesn't we're matter second. who's first. We're second. <laughs> who cares? And you guys know that. That's why you're listening right now. <laughs> we're, we're we're America's second favorite podcast. God, that's fucking funny. <laughs> but go over to the Midnight Train Podcast.com, click on the Patreon button, or go to patreon.com forward slash accidental dads. And yeah. for as little as five bucks a month, you can get all kinds of cool stuff, all the bonuses. You can get custom posters and stickers and uh, icons and outlaws, bonus bonuses, episodes as yeah. well. Yep. You know, we try to uh, put out at least one um, uh, bonus episode a week which is actually a lot more than a lot of places do. I, did, I just realized not too long ago, yeah, a lot of podcasts yeah. don't put them out that much. So listen, do us a favor. Help us out. Get us out of here. You know what I mean? Get what us out. Huh? What'd you do? Hear that? No. You, you seriously do? didn't just hear that? No. <laughs> what are you talking about? Dude, I just heard like somebody talking in my headphones. <laughs> you didn't fucking hear that? No, I did not hear that. We're going to go We're gonna go back and listen to this shit out of Okay. Me. I swear, unless it was... I don't know. I swear I heard someone talking. It's those uh, ghost children. Fuck you. (laughs) But just do us a favor. Sign up and become a Patreon like the rest of our poopers who are so freaking amazing. And also uh, do us a favor. Follow us on all of our socials like uh, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Over at Spotify, you can rate us there if you're not listening at Spotify. And it's uh, pretty awesome. We're actually moving up. We're getting a lot of good ratings on there. Yeah. It's good stuff. Good. Yeah, and, uh, you know, we're just kind of doing our thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right, you know. And tell your friends, please. Also, that's, that's I just want to say uh, real quick, thank you, Great Britain. Uh, we were we shot up to number six on yeah. the Apple charts for yeah. comedy fiction over in Great Britain. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Uh, I don't know where that came from, but that was awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for allowing us to be your second favorite podcast. Yeah. <laughs> We appreciate the privilege. <laughs> That's right. So listen, uh, honestly, we can't thank you guys enough. Truthfully, it's always a blast. It's always fun to sit here and do these stories and stuff. But we do it because you guys want to hear what we're talking about. And uh, you're absolutely amazing out there. Um, I, I know that we have uh, a, a lot of cool stuff coming up. And uh, Moody, yeah. any idea what we're doing next week? No, no. <laughs> I got a few I got a few things down the pipeline. You got a few things I, in the works? It's just like I get I get a couple ideas and then I kind of look at a few things and then I just go from there. And, All right. Uh, I don't know for sure what I'm going to do. It's going to be good, though. Yeah. I'm. Uh, We're getting dark again. I'm steering uh, towards something with aliens, but I don't know. We Ooh. haven't done aliens in a while. We have not done aliens in a while. Yeah, so maybe we'll I'm, do some uh, alien stuff. Yeah, I'm kind of. Do some I'm alien kinda, butt stuff. Kind of steering towards that. We'll see, though. Yeah. We'll see Al- alien butt stuff. Well, maybe. Okay. Definitely butt stuff. I don't know about alien. (laughs) Well, listen, a very special thank you to our fearless executive. Uh Uh-oh. The joke. The joke. All right. Oh, I forgot. I forgot. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Stop me if you've heard this one. That's it. Get everyone's attention. Stop stop me if you've heard this one. It's the the worst. Oh, it's terrible. Okay. Go ahead. All right. (laughs) So there's three moles, right? They're going through their tunnel. Like the animal. Yes. Okay. They're going through the tunnel. Okay. And they're looking for food. Okay. Right. And the first mole, he's just like, like sniffing, like ah, smell, smell carrots. I smell carrots. Second mole goes, hmm, smell, I smell potatoes. He's like, so you guys smell potatoes? And the last mole in line looks around. And he's like, all I smell are molasses. <laughs> you, you can't laugh during the punchline. <laughs> All I smell is molasses. Mole asses. Get it? Oh. Yeah. You know what? I think you just started a new thing. Every week, you've got to tell a joke at the end of the episode. Oh, all right. Yeah, you have to. All right. Yeah, That's you, fine. you have to do that. 
You know, I didn't I didn't get any good puns in today, so I figured I'd get the joke. <laughs> you laughed in the middle of it, though. I can't help it. It's funny. <laughs> Molasses. Oh, my God. My wife's going to love that one. She is just, the, she loves those kinds of jokes. Oh, my God. She's going to tell everyone at work tomorrow, too. <laughs> so, listen, a very special thank you to our fearless executive Patreon producer, Poopers, to... <laughs> To Zachary, Zachary Danielson, Joseph Aramo, Margaret Dempsey, Kelly Ryan, Corey Kukowski, Nathan Diekman, Hank Sanchez, Stacey Laconan, Nicholas Cooper, Caitlin McKinney, Trent Scott, Spencer Dunlap, Jacob Cook, Maggie Brothers, Albert Lopez, Miles Campbell, Brian Gunsman, Margaret Atkins, Colleen Cox, Pumpkin Escobar, Mac Doherty, Turner Cox, Sydney Sayer, Gina Madison, Janet Shirell, Chad Flint, Chris McLeod, Justin Kowalczyk, Rob Webb from the Fun Box Podcast. Make sure you're checking out the Fun Box Podcast. Christina Skeleton, Skeleton, damn it, I was doing so good. <laughs> Christina Skeleton oh, and Jessica Barlamé no. from the Sisters Skeleton yes, podcast. Correct. Make sure you check those ladies out. They're amazing. To Maria Gibbs, to Chainsaw. What the fuck? Jigsaw, Rick Resler, Courtney Batchelor, Katie Brabinick, and of course, our boy, Bill Birch. Hold on. <gasps> oh, good for you. It feels good when I do that. Beautiful. So spread the word. And if you want your name to be mentioned at the end of the show, just like the rest of these beautiful people and for us to be forever grateful, become a Patreon producer, tell people about it. And uh, yeah, let's take over the world and be uh, the world's second favorite podcast. Fuck yeah, dude. That's our goal. That's our goal. That's so stupid. (laughs) That shirt will be available in less than a week. I promise. (laughs) All right. Thank you guys so much for listening. And in the meantime, as uh, you know, stay safe out there. Do your thing. And of course, choo choo, motherfuckers. Now go home and get your fucking shine box. Molasses.